Good afternoon. Good afternoon, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing this streaming of our meeting. And welcome to the Climate Change and Environment Advisory Committee of South Cam District Council. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm the chair of the Climate and Environment Committee. And for the information of members of the public, our committee advises Cabinet on the actions required to achieve the Council's targets, both on climate change and on doubling nature and its environmental commitments. Um, those who are in the chamber, several of us too are coming, the members are virtually um, participating, but all of those that are here together with us in the council chamber, please note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point, so be careful what you have there, um, and your phones as well, and the camera follows the microphone being switched on. So when you're switching on to speaking, the camera will hone in on you. Um, and those that are participating in the meeting via the live stream, please indicate that you want to speak via the chat function. Um, and who will be following the chat function to help me with that to know? Because I won't be following the chat function. Is there anybody who can do that? Or Siobhan, would you be able to do that? Are you able to do that on the chat function? Uh, yes, certainly. I'll, I, will, I will do that, yes. Thank you very much. And everyone making sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do so. Um, silence any other devices, please. Please use a headset if you can when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. And when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And switch it off immediately when you've finished. And please speak slowly and clearly and don't talk over or interrupt anyone. Um, if we do need to vote on any item, we shall do so via these appliances, the microphones, but we um, won't have any of those voting options today, I don't think. But only those who are present in the chamber. So two of our members are participating. We can see you here lovely on the screen. Two members, hello. <laughs> two of you are participating. So, um, of course, you can debate with us, you can comment and anything, but if we do have to make any decisions, you wouldn't be able to take part in that as only um, all decision makers need to be in the room. Thank you. So committee members, I'm going to now e invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Um, so my name's Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm chair of the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee, and my vice chair, Councillor Martin Kahn. Hello, I am, I'm vice chair, and I'm member for Hisgin Hill and Beacon. Thank you very much. And Councillor Jeff Harvey, my other vice chair. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Jeff Harvey, um, the member for Horsham. Thank you very much. And Councillor Paul Bearpark. Uh, hello, I'm Councillor Paul Bearpark, um, member for uh, Milton and Woodbridge. And um, standing in for Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, we have Councillor Sue Ellington. Lovely Swaze. to have you with us. Thank you very much, Councillor Ellington. And standing in for Councillor Graham Cohen. Uh, Mark Howell. Thank you very much, lovely to have you here. And Councillor Peter Fain, please introduce yourself. Yes, Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you very much. And I'm also delighted to have here our lead cabinet member for climate and environment, Councillor Bridget Smith. Uh, hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to note that we have with us as well, Patrick who is doing a fantastic job, always with the minutes and keeping it all prepared for the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the officers um, will introduce themselves as they come to each of the different items that they'll help us with. Um, and also, we've got some other officers in the meeting. Are you already with us? We have Emma Davis, Principal Sustainability Consultant. Are you with us already, Emma? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Lovely. To, hello. Lovely to see you, Emma. Thank nice you. to see everyone. Welcome. And Emma Dyer, our project officer in climate and environment. Yes, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Emma. I've got your lovely, lovely silhouette there, but we know. Lovely. And Siobhan Mellon, of course, who is our principal development officer for climate and environment. Thank you very much. Hi, Siobhan. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Um, if anyone needs to leave the meeting at any time, members, would you please make that known to me so we can record it in the minutes? Um, and apologies, please, Patrick. Yes, Chair, we've had apologies from Councillor Graham Cohn and also from Grenville Chamberlain. And Councillor Mark Howell is, is uh, subbing for Councillor Graham Cohn. Councillor Sue Ellington is virtually subbing for Councillor Grenville Chamberlain. Lovely, and they are very welcome. 
Do we have any declarations of interest for any of the items on the agenda? I take that as a no. Thank you. Agenda item three, the minutes of um, the last meeting. Do we have any comments on the minutes of the last meeting? Monday, 14th of June. We've got page one, page two, page three, and page four. Can I take it by affirmation that we have approved the minutes, minutes of the last meeting? The affirmation members, yes? yes? Good, thank you very much. Okay, and just on that, I want to once again say how fantastic it was to have a couple of those presentations at the last meeting, and on the chalk streams one that we had from Guy Belcher, that was absolutely fantastic. Even our IT team was saying they learned so much about that. That was very, very good. Um, and we will see in our action plan that we're following up on some of those actions that came out from last meeting. Good, and if we can go now um, to matters arising from the minutes, are there any matters arising apart from the ones I've just mentioned? I can update that um, the following the chalk streams report, uh, we did meet. Sorry, I have an echo. I don't know if everybody else. Has no, we can hear you perfectly, up. Siobhan. You can hear me all right. <laughs> um, but uh, Lee Hillam, our watercourse and drainage manager met with Guy Belcher and Rob Mungoven with a uh, very fruitful meeting to um, ensure that our watercourses are managed as well as they can be for biodiversity. So that work is, is set in train. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And we would love to have some kind of report back at some point just to see the kind of things that, that are happening with that. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Any other matters arising from the minutes? No. Thank you very much. And we're going now to agenda item five. Um, and in your agenda pack, you see this is about the Nature Smart Cities um, business model. Now, this is something, members, which is very interesting. We've talked about the importance of um, biodiversity, the ecological emergency, our doubling nature strategy, the system document for our zero carbon strategy. And we've seen that mainly as nature enhancement, wildlife enhancement, um, and carbon capture. Our doubling nature strategy, um, which has really been praised by many for its brilliant way of being able to a communicating document, easy for everybody to read, has a section on natural capital. And what does that mean? It means, you know, what's, what are the services that nature brings us? What are they worth and how can we make sure we're using them properly? And that's around sort of our water and the um, air, clean air, clean soils, um, and things like that. So we haven't really looked yet, apart from in some of our planning policies, how we can embed natural capital into the design of the things we're doing as a council as well as what's happening within our planning policy. And Nature Smart Cities is a program that Cambridge City is one of the um, partners for and is doing one of the um, pilot tests with this program. And it's involving over 75 local authorities in four different countries across the two seas. And we're going to have a little bit of a presentation to it now. But it would be very interesting, seeing as Cambridge City is also involved, they're opening this up now to other local authorities to get involved. And that's why we've invited um, along now, I'm very happy to have Anna Oxenham and Phil back, um, who are with us. Hello, Anna. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the, for the invite to this meeting. Thank you. Do you want me to just take it away with the presentation for myself and Phil? Yes, please, Anne. If you want to introduce yourselves, that would be... Hello, Phil. Nice to have you with us. Right, great. So I'm just going to share my presentation. Um, so Anna has been working in the Cambridgeshire area for quite a long time. She's now in Southend-on-Sea as one of the um, council members leading on this programme. Yes, so thank you very much. I hope you can all see my screen, and thank you for the introduction, Pippa. Yes, I've been working at South End on Sea Borough Council since August 2019. Um, I work as part of the energy and sustainability team um, at South End on Sea. Uh, but my main role involves the management of the EU Interreg Nature Smart Cities project, for which South End on Sea 
is the large, uh, the lead partner. So um, just to give you an introduction to the Nature Smart Cities project, it's a project up to the value of 6.38 million euros. Um, the project includes 11 partners um, from across four countries. And as Pippa mentioned, um, Cambridge City Council is, is one of the partners who is, is involved in this project and implementing a green infrastructure pilot to help test the business model we are developing. So I'm hopefully now going to use an animated video to quickly introduce the, the project to you. So if you can't hear the sound, um, it should, you should be able to hear it, but please just shout out and, and let me know. Around three quarters of Europeans live in cities. Many of these cities are dealing with the effects of climate change, such as heat stress, air pollution, and flooding. The high density of paved surfaces, roads, and buildings further increases these effects. We can do something about this. Trees, rain gardens, green roofs and walls, and other vegetation help to cool cities on hot summer days, capture heavy rainfall, and improve air quality. Research shows that green infrastructure provides a range of other benefits, such as increased biodiversity and improved human health. However, cities often find green infrastructure expensive or difficult to implement. The Nature Smart Cities project aims to support cities to address these challenges. Eight city partners and three academic partners in the UK, Belgium, the Netherlands and France have joined forces. Together, we will develop a business model to promote green infrastructure solutions, bridging the gap between research and practice. The model is based on evidence that we collect through interviews with local authorities and analysis of geographical, biophysical and economic data. We also review existing valuation tools and finance options. The model is tested, validated and refined through several green infrastructure pilots, South End on Sea, Cambridge, The Hague, Capella, Antwerp, Bruges and Lille. Step-by-step -step methodology will support cities to use this business model to implement green infrastructure and build climate resilience. For more information, visit our website, naturesmartcities.eu. Around three... Sorry. <laughs> so moving on, um, as the video described, the main output of the, the Nature Smart Cities project will be a new business model uh, to small, support smaller local authorities that's lows with populations less than 550,000 to make the business case for green infrastructure solutions over more traditional grey approaches. Um, the scheme on the screen shows an overview of how the business model is going to be produced um, through, through various inputs um, and, and tested through the use of the seven green infrastructure pilots. Um, I wanted to highlight some of the work undertaken um, firstly in, those first, in the first stages of the project as inputs designed to support um, the development of the business model and ensure it meets the intended needs of its users. Firstly, I wanted to just briefly touch on um, a series of 53 semi-structured interviews that were under, undertaken. So we undertook a series of semi-structured interviews um, with, with 53, local, um, 53 local authorities. Um, and this work was carried out by Imperial College London and in fact by, by Phil Back, who you'll hear from um, in a moment. Um, so the, these interviews were undertaken with 53 practitioners, um, that's officers, senior officers, councillors and aldermen working on green infrastructure projects or, um, or strategies in smaller city. Um, this, the interviews covered a lot of in, uh, material, but mostly councils, um, participants were asked about councils' priorities, not their individual priorities. Um, when implementing green infrastructure 
they were also asked about the um, obstacles that might hinder the progress of GI projects and ideas. And we also, through the semi-structured interviews, sought some feedback about the tools available to help cities assess the value of green infrastructure projects. And if you want to, to, to read more about those semi-structured interviews um, and, uh, and the results, there are a couple of um, resources available. There's a report and a summary brochure that can be accessed online through the, the Nature Smart Cities Library. So those interviews really are great, gave us a lot of useful feedback from local authorities to help us assess the barriers that they face and also identify their needs from a business model that can support them to make the evidence base for green infrastructure projects. We also, as one of our inputs to help us design the business model, undertook a review of finance options for green infrastructure projects. So in 2019, Imperial College London and South End Borough Council, we contracted ZN, um, that's an, a financial think tank, to under, undertake a review of innovative, innovative, and I'm really talking about innovative, green finance options that could be available to local authorities to fund urban greening projects. Through the work, a wide range of financing mechanisms were reviewed, including equity investment, debt funding, such as green loans and bonds and policy performance bonds, philanthropy, crowdfunding, permit trading, and even more novel schemes, such as crowdfunding and time banks. So these really are quite innovative approaches um, for local authorities to try to access funds. Um, the full report is again available from the Nature Smart Cities website. But the main conclusion of this work um, is really well, really quite well summarized by this diagram that I'm sharing now, in that different green finance options can be suitable for different types of GI projects depending on the main benefits they deliver. So um, just looking at the screen, the internal bubbles are the different benefits you can derive from different green infrastructure projects. And then you have the larger bubbles in the corner, um, which are the different types of funding mechanism that a local authority can look over. However, the main conclusion of the report was that to date, there has been limited use of these more innovative green financial mechanisms. There are currently a number of barriers to their use. Um, one such barrier being that individual green infrastructure projects are normally relatively small scale um, and looking for quite minor funds in relation to these, these financial mechanisms. And that it might be necessary to look at vehicles which can, which can support the aggregation necessary to reach the green finance levels needed for these uh, for the, to make these financial mechanisms work. We also took the results of this review and the, the financial mechanisms that we reviewed um, into the semi-structured interviews with those uh, 53 participants. And we asked them if they'd heard of or used um, these green finance approach, approaches before. And it was found that the majority have not considered these different mechanisms and in some cases didn't know that they might be applicable. In fact, the interview showed that small authorities don't have the time to monitor new funding opportunities, don't tend to look at what other municipalities are doing, and are slow to explore potential collaboration, collaborations across municipal boundaries that might make accessing these financial mechanisms easier. So moving away from, from the inputs that helped to shape and design the business model, I quickly wanted to just provide some invite, insights into the business model and how it works. And I'm going to be followed by Phil, that's going to, who's going to give us some more, more information on this. So I just wanted to run through a summary of the features of the business model that's being developed under the Nature Smart Cities uh, project. So importantly, the business model we are developing will support local authorities to make the arguments needed to justify investments in green infrastructure. 
It will do this by enabling users to compare green, a gray and green scenarios. In fact, a large number of or multiple green scenarios can be compared when using the business model. The business model will provide an evidence base and through its output, which is business case fact sheets, it will provide a clear structure and visual representation of this information that can be used to help support decision making around green infrastructure projects. At the heart of the business model will be a multi criteria analysis that enables users to select the priority ecosystem services for their green infrastructure project. The business model can support the calculation of qualitative, quantitative or even economic values for 15 ecosystem services. Um, we're now going to hear a bit more about the business model from Phil shortly, but I just wanted to share the, the timeline for the uh, production of our business model with you. Um, at the moment, we have a first draft version of our business model. That's an internal uh, version for use by the project. And we're about to embark on a series um, of demonstrator testings with four local authorities across four countries that will help us to test our business model in real life and to see how it can be uh, refined and tailored to make sure it really does meet the, the needs of our users. This will enable us at the end of the year to have a better, a beta version of our business model, which will be available externally from our website. Um, early next year, we, we will hold um, a capacity building program. And um, through this, we will, um, this capacity building program will be designed to support local authorities to bridge the knowledge gap and build capacity to self-finance GI projects. The capacity building uh, program will be rolled out across the four project countries um, in the project. And in the UK, the program will consist of two workshops, the first in March 2022 and the second in June 2022. Uh, we will launch a registration system um, for, for this capacity building program in September and October this year. Um, so if you are interested, please sign up to the Nature Smart Cities newsletter and you will be alerted as to when our registration system is open for the capacity building program. Following the program, we will have hopefully up to 75 or over 75 local authorities involved in the program from across the four project countries. And this will enable us to further test and refine the business model to ensure that it meets the needs of the local, our local authorities. And we hope to use this to refine the business model and release a final version online in June, July next year. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Phil. He's going to talk about um, the demonstrator testing we're going to shortly be undertaking and how that's going to support the business model. Councillor Haling, can I just interrupt to say that Councillor Fain, Peter Fain has, has put questions, has, has a question. Chair, I wonder whether it might be appropriate for my question to wait until the end of uh, Bill Back's presentation, probably. Thank you. Completely agree. Thank you, Peter. We'll listen to Phil um, and then we can ask your question. Thanks. OK, well, thank you, Anna. And um, it's a pleasure to be back in South Cambridgeshire. Uh, I was trying to work out the last time I was in your council chamber. I think it was 15 years ago. Um, uh, but I have a long and strong connection, both business and personal, with the Cambridge area, and it's nice to be working with you. As Anna said, the, the reasoning behind the business model is to enable authorities to make a stronger case for their green infrastructure projects. Uh, and this business model is a new tool. It's been developed academically by um, some very powerful minds in the universities of Antwerp and Ghent. Um, but it's very different from the many, many tools 
that have been developed by academics and which are largely unused by practitioners. It's a complex model, but the complexity is concealed inside a spreadsheet which is much more accessible um, than it might otherwise be. Uh, it works by using publicly available peer-reviewed data on those different ecosystem services that Anna mentioned uh, linked to the characteristics of your specific green infrastructure project. It comes with guidance on a step-by-step -step approach, which is also part of the project. And our overall aim is to meet the key criteria that emerged in the interview program that we did, which were that the tool should be usable by practitioners, comprehensive in covering all the possible ecosystem services that a project might generate, and credible. It must produce output that you have confidence in. It's not simply an academic exercise. So we're now entering the test phase. We've done some initial testing uh, using our own pilot projects in the seven cities that you saw on the map. But we're also required to test it independently. And we're inviting local authorities now to consider whether they'd like to be a test authority for this phase. Uh, we're looking for at least one authority in each of our four uh, Nature Smart Cities countries. And uh, we're taking expressions of interest at the moment. So what might be involved in getting involved in demonstrator testing? Well, first of all, the authority would need to be willing to do some preparation, but it's reasonably straightforward and we'll guide you on it once we know what your project is. Uh, in fact, I've already uh, done some guidance for a couple of, of projects that I'm looking at um, as a, a trial run, and it didn't take me very long at all. You'll need to set aside the time to meet me. I'm going to do all the tests and to run the test project through the system. And as you do that, I want to watch you at work, make notes as you make progress or perhaps get stuck, and where necessary, help you forward. I'll want to review the output with you and get your feedback on whether you think it, uh, it is convincing and whether you think it's accurate. And I want your feedback more generally uh, by asking you some questions about your experience. Essentially, it's a how was it for you kind of exercise. And what's very important about this is it's testing our model. It's not testing you. It's not testing your ability your level of knowledge or your authority. This is a model that's supposed to be accessible to smaller cities uh, with all the limitations that come with being part of a smaller city. What do you get out of it? Well, there'll be an output document at the end of the process, uh, the fact sheet that Anna mentioned, that might help you to make the case for your project with those who are going to make decisions about it. But you also get first-hand experience of using a new tool that's actually been developed with municipalities like yours and projects like yours. A lot of the tools that are out there were developed for huge cities with very specialized staff. This one hasn't. This one's been tailored, we hope, to the needs of this particular marketplace. You also have a chance to contribute to the tool's development and refinement and a chance to participate in the capacity building events that are coming up next year. Now, that could either be in the form of a case study to show how the tool worked in practical application in your setting, or it could be in person if you fancy actually standing up and talking about your experience. Either way, there'd be positive international publicity for your municipality and for your green infrastructure work. So, a chance to put South Cambridgeshire uh, on a much wider map than it might be on at the moment. And of course, there are benefits for us as well. We become aware of challenges that we haven't yet addressed properly in the business model, and we can adapt the business model to meet those challenges. We can develop case studies, which we can anonymize if you prefer, based on your project and your experience of using the model. Above all, we can prove the concept that our business model intended for smaller cities 
intended for the kind of project smaller cities get involved with, and by smaller cities I also include rural communities as well, uh, that this model actually works and is useful uh, in this different context. So you can stay updated on the progress of the demonstrator testing uh, using the Nature Smart Cities website, naturesmartcities.eu. You can subscribe to our newsletter from the website, and uh, you can do that by uh, using the green QR code on this slide, either now or later when the slides are circulated. Or you can follow our LinkedIn page using the LinkedIn QR code, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. But I would say that finding out more about uh, the demonstrator testing, finding out more about Nature Smart Cities doesn't commit you at all. So please investigate this opportunity and let's decide whether or not it's for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And before bringing in um, Councillor Fain in terms of his question and the other questions that you may have, um, one is a declaration of interest I should have made right at the very beginning, which I forgot. But in the capacity building element of this program, professionally, I'll be involved in that, which is after all of the demonstrator testing and things like that. So that's how I've come to know about this project. And I thought South Cambridge would be, would, you know, South Cambridge could be very, very interested. The second is that together with our green investment officer and our biodiversity officers, um, we were looking at South Cam's investment program and strategy. And when we were looking at when we invest, for example, in property, and we looked at how can we make sure that that's hitting our zero carbon targets, that we've got green infrastructure, natural capital, it was, yeah, but this is an investment project. We've got to make sure it's got the proper returns. These are costly. How do we justify that? And so we were looking at, well, how, what does value mean? And how do we quantify value apart from just monetized value? How do we quantify costs which often are not internalized, like the cost of flooding in the buildings. That's not often you know, quantified. The cost of air pollution isn't normally internalized in when you're putting concrete down. You know? So it's how do we look at the different costs and benefits in a comparable way that would enable us to make procurement and investment decisions as a council? And this business model is about that. How do you justify investment? How do you quantify this? Um, all the things that we're speaking about. Thirdly, as Phil said, cities, this is about smaller authorities as well. So as long as you've got urban areas within smaller authorities, this can, can be for us. And just finally, it was two weeks ago that the UK climate risk assessment showed us just really the, the risks that we are at in terms of flooding and urban heat stress in the UK now have just accelerated hugely. And so all of our building design needs to take into consideration you know, those aspects now. And so it's that design element. That's just what I want to say. Councillor Fain, you had a question. Sure, I would fully understand if you want to take questions from those that are on first. I just entered my question in the chat. Would you like me to carry on or wait my turn? Carry on. Right. Well, I'm very encouraged to hear of continuing cooperate, cooperation within the North Sea region. But I suppose my question relates to the rhinoceros in the room. Uh, as I understand the withdrawal agreement, um, UK has opted out of European territorial cooperation. And that means we won't be in the next interreg program, which is 2021 to 2027. Now, as I understand it, some projects will continue to June 2023. Anna or Phil will correct me if I'm wrong on that. But it does seem to me this raises the importance of either finding new means of cooperation, which may be difficult outside the, uh, outside the terms of the withdrawal agreement, or alternatively looking at transition, possibly a period of combination with UK programmes. Now, the only Nature Cities programme I'm sort of familiar with in Cambridgeshire is the Cambridge Canopy Project, um, which is intended to improve uh, forest cover in certain parts of, of Cambridge City where it's very low in some areas. And I just wonder what consideration could be given with programs like that to moving towards or combining with UK schemes um, we have in this 
committee in the past discussed the invitation from DEFRA to join the community forest schemes applying to forests in and around cities. And it seems to me maybe there's some scope for combining that uh, with the canopy project being run in Cambridge City. But is there some way of making the transition within Interreg? And what do we do to maintain progress on these schemes, bearing in mind that presumably they will end in June 2023 or thereabouts? Um, Anna, would you like to answer that at all? And it's a wider question than the one you brought here, but would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I will have a go. Thank you very much for the question. Well, firstly, the Cambridge Canopy Project is actually um, the green infrastructure investment for C Cambridge City Council under the Nature Smart Cities Project. So it's been it's been run under under this project. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Um, we after uh, Nature Smart Cities and, and other interact projects. Um, which, which, were take, uh, which were started at the same time, they will run to completion, um, but then we are no longer able to participate um, in interreg programs. I can't speak exactly or answer what, um, what programs we can get in, involved in the future. I know that we are thinking about this in South End Borough Council, but I will say that I think this is one of the aims of the Nature Smart Cities business model is about making that, that business case, understanding, as Pip has said, what is the value of investing in these green infrastructure projects? And that will hopefully help to identify alternative sources of funding for these green infrastructure projects. So we're not always reliant on the grants um, that, that we have been in the, in the past um, to, to, to make these, these projects a reality. So I think that's that's very interesting. Um, I think also, I know that there's a number of investment projects looking at green infrastructure and how to make green infrastructure investment plans. We've been collaborating with one of those. One is called Ignition, and that's in the, in the Manchester, uh, being undertaken by the Manchester Greater Authority. So how do you develop a, a successful investment plan for a suite of green infrastructure projects? But in terms of where we go next, to, to support this work financially, we, we do have to, to look elsewhere, but I, I can't completely answer that question. It's a very, very open question. Thank you, Anna. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I think we know it is, a, it is a broader one, but it, I think your answer as well, beyond what, what Councillor Fain was, was um, obviously looking at, is, is the, the suite of potential financial instruments that could, we could be exploring for investment in some of these. Councillor Khan. Yeah, uh, I want to come back again to this, the fu uh, future outlook. Um, I mean, I think it's very interesting to have this approach uh, to look at the way you justify investment uh, through various means. Um, it's, it's very helpful. Uh, in practice, um, many nature um, type projects in, in local authorities, municipalities, um, is, uh, are linked to um, opportunities which arise. Um, it's very much a sort of field in which opportunism you take up an opportunity to arise or not at all. Uh, that, that's rather unfortunate. I mean, uh, I, rem I, worked, I worked for 20 years in a, in a local authority on nature's projects, so it's, it's, it's my background. And I, I also must declare an interest that I worked on an international network of local authorities on energy for, 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 for 12 years. So this, I have a background and interest uh, in the field. Um, the, uh, I feel there's a need, uh, so, so you want to have to have, be able to know how you can justify opportunities that arise, and a policy like this helps. But it's also very useful to exchange experience on projects that have arisen to see how, um, how they've been implemented and what factors that uh, create success. That way you can find it easier to justify. Um, I'm very much in favor of these exchange projects. I think it's a tragedy that we're not continuing to participate. I did a lot of interreg projects myself, so I, I, I have some experience of it. One doesn't under, one underestimates the value of going and seeing what other people are doing in, in other European countries. Where people start from a different basic um, concept, a way of looking at life because there are different cultures and different local authority structures. Um, and it works both ways. One, you can see what you're doing well, 
which you didn't realize you were doing so well because you see that other people have problems in this field. And you also see what you could improve on because people have succeeded more. Um, I work for an organization called Energy Cities, which is an international network uh, uh, on, on energy issues of local authorities, municipalities. They call themselves cities. The, the confusion of the word cities shows some of the problems we have between different cultures. In Britain, a city means a city. In Europe, it's often, or in America, it, it means any old local authority. Um, so that, uh, uh, but the, the, this, local, this network didn't just include people in the, uh, able to participate in the European Union program. Uh, they had other members, so um, they, they continued to exchange information. Are you planning to ex continue Nature Smart Cities beyond, beyond the uh, interreg period as another organization? Have you future plans to have, a, say, a membership organization to continue in the same way as Energy Cities work? Um, or, uh, which would have to obviously, because, you, because your participation in the organization would have to be funded at a local level. Um, or, or is, do you have any dreams in the future about how that might take place? We, uh, uh, Phil, did you want to go? Yeah, I, I'd like to pick up a couple of points there, actually. Um, one was the, the issue you raised right at the beginning of the question about opportunism. Um, we found that very strongly in the uh, semi-structured interviews, um, that uh, in many cases, in many projects, green was added as an afterthought, and, um, and green was marginalized to some extent by the big budget spending departments, um, which in in the European context, at least, were mostly housing and highways, um, and that um, you know green was added because oh we ought to have something green, or there's a little bit of space left over where we could plant a couple of trees, um, and uh, it's clear that green needs to uh, assert itself more uh, in those contexts uh, and to um, to find a place at the table where these where these projects are, are discussed, so that the green components can be designed in rather than simply added later. Um, one of the problems with that is that that um, the big budget departments, um, you know, they have their targets, and uh, those targets are for a number of housing units, not for an amount of green space, uh, and so it's difficult to find a place at that table. We hope that our business model will add credibility to the green arguments by, by demonstrating the investment case for green infrastructure uh, and by making it clear that um, it's not just to make the place look nice, it's actually uh, achieving much more besides that. As to the future, um, part of the uh, hoped for legacy of this particular interreg project is a network of cities that will exchange information uh, about the business model, about their experience of using the business model. Uh, and I, I see no reason why that network shouldn't include other municipalities that uh, are interested in using the business model or have some experience uh, in working with it uh, that they might also share. Um, the, uh, the question of how that's to be funded and sustained is one that we haven't addressed yet. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, I'd like to bring us from that sort of now to you know, interest perhaps here in South Chelmsworth. We're not a city, we're a small um, semi-rural, but growth with lots of new um, or areas which are urban areas and urban areas that we're looking at how do we make them thriving urban areas as we're having you know problems with high streets and with what's happening with those business centers. So I think we've got quite a few areas where we could and should be looking at what does, role does green infrastructure play with that. We've also got the Oxcam art where we're saying we're applying green, but how do you design it in? And how do you justify designing it in from the beginning? Now, one of the ways we could become involved in learning more about that, and with our previous green energy investment officer, what he was finding very difficult, even within South Cams, was just getting that, getting to the table with procurement and investment office to say, we can design these things in, but what's the value of them? Now, if we could take part in the demonstrator testing, which means we actually experiment with this methodology for the business case, you know, that could be interesting for us. It would mean that we would have to be sort of thinking of a project that we could apply it to. A couple of ideas come to my mind. One is the greening of South Cam's Hall. 
we haven't really thought very much about what's already happening with water in the building, which is he's already using partially rainwater um, and, and reusing of that rainwater and coming in. But could we do more about that? If we look at the whole of this area, we have got, in a way, some green infrastructure, but is it being used um, as we come here and you see the ponds that we have and the green areas? Are there ways that we can include our building without too great a cost? To make sure we're looking at issues around flooding, we're looking at issues around peak management in the car parks and in the outer areas. Green walls. We've got huge walls here. You know, what would it take to have green walls or green roofs? I don't know, but South, Greening South Camps Hall is one of them. We're also looking at um, this investment in the housing opposite where we are in the office area. What about looking at how we design in? Now, doing the demonstrator testing doesn't mean we have to actually do it. It means we find out what that would cost. What would it take to do something like that? And we understand it. And at the same time, the project gets to understand how applicable this is to a kind of authority like ours. And again, it doesn't mean that we get selected, but are we interested in taking up this offer? And I see um, Councillor Ellington here, you know, looking at how we manage land for flooding as well in any of the new types of development. That's why I'm really interested. And what's fascinating is those European countries are mainly looking at flooding issues, how they manage flooding in development. They've greened car park areas and all sorts of things, so they manage those for what they're already experiencing, but we're probably going to experience, if anybody saw the flash floods in London just yesterday, you know, how we deal with some of these things. So I would just like to know, are we interested in it? Would it now, um, I know that Phil, when he did these interviews, found out that for most local authorities, they found this wasn't a priority. You just couldn't get it onto the agenda because they've got so much to do. Very confusing around green infrastructure terminology. Everyone thinks it's something different. Um, but that, and not even having the time to be able to look for funding to be able to have staff that can help you do this. <laughs> you know, you're just in that vicious cycle. So even if we did, we would know that we would have to have somebody ready to be actually working alongside this, perhaps the procurement team, as they're looking at the greening cameras, you know, what we're doing with that. But somebody's going to have to spend a bit of time, and we are not, we don't take that lightly. So even though there would be no cost to us, real, you know, monetary costs for taking part in it, it, it would commit somebody's time just to think about applying for this and thinking about what we could apply for it with. So members... Councillor Ellington. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment, really. Um, I'm, I'm very keen on what you're talking about, and I think it would be excellent because I'm basically a rural person, and I'm very happy to have rural going into cities. But I think there are issues which don't seem to be being addressed. When I look at the A14, um, the amount of greening that's being done there, there are thousands and thousands of trees being planted about along the new A14. And there are thousands of them that are as dead as dodos because nobody has been looking after them. And so it does take management to make these things happen and be effective. And then I look at the other bit in my life, which is that I have a pest control company, you may or may not know. And with nature comes an awful lot of other nature that we might not be quite so happy to have. But it is important that we do have it. The voles, the moles, the rats and the rabbits, they're all part of making that rural area and that green work. So I'll shut up now. No, that's lovely. Um, thank you very much, Kath Arrington. And I will take a couple of comments and questions, then we'll go back to Anna and Phil. Thank you very much. Councillor Palmer. No, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. No, I just wanted to continue on on your um, thought that we might apply some of this to South Camps Hall. And of course, um, I wonder if the model would, would actually account for the, the sort of multiplication effect that we would then have uh, providing an exemplar to other owners of, of similar sort of commercial properties when we improve our game at South Camps Hall, which is obviously part of what we're doing with uh, the greening programme. Councillor Howard. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a couple of um, points. 
first of all, with regards to us being um, doing our different activities and we're going to be watched and uh, looked at how that, I hope we're also going to be advised at the same time. So if we are going to do something which is not going to work, that we are told, well, that doesn't actually work already. We know that. Otherwise, we're going to have to get somebody in who will actually help us and advise us what to do. So that's the first thing. Um, the other thing is, is that in the future, we, we need to look at how we're going to do this. I've got a little issue at the moment. There's some trees in the sense we've had several thousand trees planted. And now, um, 10 years down the line, I've got seven, several thousand plastic covers mm -hmm. to remove off those trees. And I'm somehow going to have to dispose of them. So it's those type of things as well. What's going to happen 10 years down the line when we've got the plastic covering on the trees that we've got to look at? And because we're going to be left with the legacy of this, on not only us, but our children. Um, and so, you know, it, it's where we go. We're going to have to have some sort of route map to go down the future, that when this grant funding comes to an end or the, um, uh, the experts go, we're going to be left here with a legacy that we're going to have to manage. And if we've got the root, tree roots, for example, upsetting buildings or upsetting roads or pathways, it's those the types of things that in 10, 20 years' time, when it was a good idea that we've got to look at and look. And we can't be the example of it because it's cost us a lot of money to put it right. We've got to know now. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Come back to South Cams again. Um, South Cams has virtually no land, and the only sort of rural land, the main rural land that it has, it has devolved Hammersmith Hodge off into Milton Country Park. We have uh, not taken on the management of recreational land. We've not. We, we, we've um, got a very. Uh, our service is basically advisory rather than implementation. Um, if we, this is an. In, we in fact turn out to be the only, only district in South, in Cambridgeshire which this is the case. Um, we can. Uh, we seem to have abandoned that, that that role or that practical implementation role. Um, it's one of my aims, one of my desires, is that we should move back into that role, and since I've been elected, the main consultation has been on climate issues. But uh, we do need to pose the question, and it's a matter of culture and priorities, whether we want to take in that role or not. Um, uh, I, when I was involved in, in management, uh, uh, working in a local authority on, on these topics, um, it was very clear that the different actions which were taken between local authorities were very much dependent on the culture at the top the attitudes at the top that were implied, and the degree to which they felt it was a role. Um, sometimes local rural authorities, because they were involved in green areas, took it very seriously or, or, were much, or were very active. Sometimes they weren't. It depends upon the priorities there. The city authorities tended to have more priority because they were much more actively involved in management of, of park areas and green areas within the city. We can see that here in Cambridge having a much stronger service uh, about, uh, and a bit older than South Cambridge. Cambridge. So that, 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 that is also a, a tradition. But we do need to think about this. Now, one comment that was made by Mr. Beck, which I think is, is relevant, is that it's very difficult when you're competing with higher funding departments. But you don't get respected at all unless you have a budget. I mean, that's the way local authorities work. So once you've got a budget, you, you have some say. So if you're wanting to do this, you're going to to be able to, it does help to be able to be able to demonstrate practice and demonstrate a budget and de demonstrate importance, uh, and that poses questions. Obviously, in a in a, in a local authority, work resources are always very restricted. Now, uh, there has been a change in public attitude from the 1980s, when there was great constant concern about the effects of um, traffic of, of public pressure on the countryside uh, uh, and the whole. The Countryside Commission was in existence, managing rural landscapes and, uh, and recreation in the countryside. Councillor Khan, so is, is it a question to the Conservative? No, it's, not, it's, a, it's a comment, it's yeah. a commentary. Uh, 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 and, um, uh, but I think it's useful in the context of it. Um, so that's been a change. So, so I think we need, in terms of our responsibilities, we do need to think about our, our role. But I thought a comment that I would come back from Mr. Beck's comment, which I thought was very useful, was when I was working in a local authority, the comment was, why don't we have bottom drawer schemes? Why don't we have projects that we wish to do, um, we, which are worked up and developed? And which means you need to have staff to do that. And even if everything else is paid for, you need to have staff to manage this. Otherwise, nothing will happen. Um, <coughs> and 
why don't we have buffer law schemes for highways at all? We should always have a, a bundle of buffer law, law, law schemes that says we draw, pull out the draw and do when money becomes available. Uh, green paper don't. You know, it's not a tradition. Um, uh, and that needs a change of culture at the top and, and in, in that sphere. Um, uh, and that's much more a matter of culture than, than, um, than anything else. <coughs> So these are, these are my observations. I, I am very keen that we should continue to participate in this field. Uh, there is actually a project going on looking at investment priorities and, and ways forward in the field in the part, uh, Future Parks Accelerator project, which we are participating in. Um, and, and that's one of the, I think will be one of the most interesting outcomes um, but, uh, of that project. Uh, and so that is something which I think may be useful for as a contact. It's still going on for another nine months. Um, so, I'm very keen that we should. I'm very keen that we should build up the experience in others. And I'm very keen that we should, we should give more priority, or higher priority to act, active action in this field rather than you know, just simply being an advisory or poll. Thank you. Know, that's you. my comment. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Khan. And we have come to the end of the time for this item on our agenda. But um, did you want to come back on and any of those, those comments, either Anna or Phil? Um, well, if I can jump in. Um, I, I actually did my doctorate on the role of the Countryside Commission in uh, addressing traffic problems in the countryside, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm interested in your comment, Councillor Khan, uh, as, as a matter of principle. But um, I, I agree with you about bottom draw schemes, and actually one of our authorities, one of the Belgian authorities, actually has bottom draw schemes um, that they can pull out when there's some leftover budget at the end of the financial year and, uh, and action. Um, at the very least that our business model would give you would be a bottom of the draw scheme. Uh, it would, it would uh, produce some hopefully um, credible and uh, convincing costings and, uh, and other output measurements um, that you could use to justify the project Maybe not now, maybe not in the foreseeable future, but certainly at least as a bottom drawer scheme for when, when the money is available. But I hope it would do much more than that. I hope it would actually allow you to look um, more critically at uh, the kind of ideas that Councillor Halings was talking about as possibilities for South Cams, for South Cams Hall, for the, uh, for the estate that, that you're on and for the housing that uh, is potentially going to be opposite you. Um, what I will say, though, is that none of this places you under any obligation uh, other than perhaps um, the, the idea that uh, this idea is worth pursuing. Um, that would be uh, entirely up to you whether you decided to move forward on part or all of any of the projects that you put through the business model, either now or in the future when you're using the, uh, the, the finished product. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. And thank you, Anna, too. So, and, and just to be clear, the pilot testing of which um, Cambridge City is a part got funding. We wouldn't be getting any funding. This is just about do we want to um, see what it's like to develop a business model, an investment case, a business case for some of the ideas we might have? Do we want to know what it would cost to integrate Mark Khan, Councillor Khan, some green infrastructure into some of the new towns we're building. You know, that's new land, you know, however it's managed, so that green space. In some of the denser you know, areas that we're doing, what would it cost us to do something pretty smart with water and energy, as well as the other things that we're doing here and for the development opposite? These are, these are things that we, you know, do we want to just, not to just, but do we want to be part of this so we can actually just work it through? Because what we found with our officers is they found it very hard to work it through. They didn't have the ability or the data or the modeling to be able to say why this was worth it. And so that's, that's what all the other councils are doing. So just how interested are you for our officers to think about applying for, to be part of a demonstrator test scheme? With all the caveats that you, print, you gave us. If that's a proposal, I'll second it. Yeah, good. Um, and I think what will be interesting, Councillor Howell, is we can find out from Cambridge as part of this team of experiences, what are they doing about routes in urban areas? Because what they're doing is they're 
With this project increasing by 2%, there can be cover in urban areas, and especially in the socially deprived areas, which have been proven to be the ones with least tree cover and the benefits from tree cover. But there are obviously in areas, just as you said, that will have issues around that. So perhaps one of the first questions you know, we can just ask a partner is, what are you learning from this project about that? Yeah. And your plastics was nice. <laughs> Somebody else. Thank you very much. We'll move, and thank you so much for your time, Anna and um, Phil. Um, and we'll be picking that up with Siobhan to see how we can take that forward. Is that okay, Siobhan? Sure, yes. Lovely. Thank you very much. And we now move on to our progress report um, on our Zero Carbon Action Plan, which you know, presents us with a progress review on how we're getting on with implementing our Zero Carbon Action Plan to the end of 21, and also an updated version. Now that we've got our sister document, which is the Doubling Nature Strategy, how do we integrate actions because these are interlinked. So integrating both our zero carbon actions and our doubling nature actions into one action plan beneath the sister strategies. Um, in your um, agenda pack, you'll find um, here the tag ratings on this. Um, and I would like to invite Siobhan, I think, Siobhan Mellon, to introduce this item. And um, thank you very much, Siobhan. Thank you, Councillor Hayling. So um, I hope everybody has got, um, uh, got the report there. As Councillor Hayling says, it, is, uh, it comes with two appendices. The first one is a review of progress on the action um, plan, which the committee saw um, in November, actually, uh, along with a, a, uh, a six-month update on progress so this is the um, update at this point, which actually is a bit more than a, a, a year um, following that. And um, so you will see, see, that uh, the stress, so, so this is the actions aligned to the zero carbon strategy, which was agreed by council last May. And the strategy, as, we, as you'll remember, covers the actions of the council, not in only in reducing our own emissions, but also in using our powers and influence to help reduce carbon emissions across the district. So it's set out in two parts. Section one is eight actions to reduce emissions on our own estate and operations. And there is a target attached to these, which was agreed as part of the strategy, and that is to achieve a 45% reduction on CO2 emissions relative to the 2018-19 baseline by 2025. And there's also a further target, which is 75% by 2030. And each action has a RAG rating where green is on track to complete by the, data, the date originally intended. Amber is where progress is being made, but there is a um, delay to the original completion date. And red is where progress is stalled. And you'll see we have four actions where progress is behind schedule, uh, not always by very much, but that is to South Cant Hall, to our upgrading of the Footway Lights Programme, to the development of a solar PV array to power our fleet, and to the rollout of fully digital meetings for members. But otherwise, the actions are on track in terms of our own estate and, 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 um, and operations. And then section two is 35 more actions grouped according to sector to support decarbonisation in the wider district. And given the limits of our influence, we don't have a target here, but we're aware that this needs to reduce by around 50% in the current decade. And of those 35 actions, 24 are on track and to schedule, seven are behind schedule but progressing, and two have stalled and are therefore red. The two that have stalled are the taxi EVC, um, taxi electric vehicle charging points, where uh, it wasn't possible to find um, suitable locations for those, and so uh, those are being located where they will be useful for South Cambridgeshire taxis, but they're actually in the city um, uh, um, geography. And also support for repair cafes as part of our recycling and waste program, uh, where COVID has just you know, completely um, uh, made that impossible. I've also marked two um, as, as in, in grey as they turned out not to be feasible, and these two relate 
to our work, encouraging, supporting, and where necessary, forcing improvements to energy performance in private rented sector households. These are, are around 10% of the households in South Cambridgeshire, and we're looking for opportunities for funding for proactive work in this area, but without this, um, uh, our approach has been reactive, and so um, those, those two are kind of, I, I sort of saw those as, as, as not really so much red as a bit of a different category. And so that's Appendix 1, one the, um, the review of the current plan. And turning to Appendix 2, this provides the 21-22 revision of the plan, um, and it incorporates 12 actions to deliver our doubling nature strategy, which was agreed by Cabinet in February. So th this um, plan, I think I've it rather improved the layout of it. Um, it's in three sections, our own estate, nine actions, the wider district, 21 actions, and the doubling nature, 12 actions. And I've taken the opportunity to iron out some issues with the previous plan, for example, removing some actions which were, um, because they were drawn from the zero, ca um, zero carbon strategy and from the um, layout of that, they, they were effectively duplicates. And if anyone is interested in the, in the detail, then the final column in Appendix 1 tells you what happens to that action in the revised plan. So you can be sure that nothing has been, nothing's just been dropped or lost. And I've also made it easier in um, section one, our own estate and operations, to see which are the parts of our own estate and operations which actually emit the most carbon. Um, so, I, so I've just marked in there um, uh, the, the proportion of carbon emissions in our baseline. Um, and so you can see that the, uh, the fleet at 67%, I think it is, um, comes out top there. And you can see how our um, carbon emissions are made up. Uh, and as you'd expect, most of the actions here are um, also in the council's business plan. Uh, so, so our zero carbon and doubling nature action plan is in is, is in large part a sort of subsection of the council's business plan, but also with some additional actions which, for various reasons, don't need to be in the business plan. So I've made that a bit clearer um, using blue ink where where an action is also in the business plan. Um, yes, yeah, so the 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 new twenty one twenty two plan. Um, I won't go through that in detail, but just to point out that the doubling nature actions, those 12 actions, they um, include actions through planning where we have our most significant um, influence, through supporting community action, how we can double, uh, help double nature supporting community action on our own estate and through our operations, and that's particularly what we are doing around our housing estate. And finally, by working with partners, and there's an action there as how we're working with Highways England to encourage a positive environmental legacy from the A48 improvement works, and, and that is later on in the agenda. So I will leave it there, but very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for such a comprehensive report. And, and in this such a easy way for us to really understand all on one page what we're doing about it what we said we would do and what's happening and, and the details in that final column of progress and explaining what's been happening is just fantastic Siobhan and so much is going on that I didn't actually even realize <laughs> that you're doing so well done Councillor Howell thank you chairman yes I do think this is an excellent report um, just a couple of little comments really um, on T8 um, which is under the first section, and it's the heading that says deliver tree plantation projects on our housing estate in collaboration with our repairs contractor. That's actually the actual part. If you look into the fourth column in the first paragraph there, it says halfway down, at least one replacement tree will be planted for each tree removed. 
um, I, I had a look up at the statistics for how much of the weight of the tree survives, and it, 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 it changes massively on the type of tree and where you're actually going to plant it. And, I, and there's people here far better than I who can tell you more about that. Um, I would like to see the word at least one replacement to put to at least two replacements because of the fact we are going to have, as Councillor Ellington said earlier on, many trees die. So I, I would like to, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same place, but if we have one tree there and one tree elsewhere, that's just a, a small thing I would like to see there because I do think otherwise we're going to lose the trees. Uh, another small point, Chairman, is under waste and recycling, and, uh, and I'm going to put it under T23 to T, sorry, A23 to A25. Um, you'll see there many um, community um, activities and different things like that with regards to recycling and all that sort. And forgive me for, for putting it underneath that, or using that as a link. I think we should start at home. I think that we, as South Cam, should be saying how we can cut down on waste. And therefore, I would like to suggest, um, Chairman, even though it's a wonderful organisation, is Radna in Powers, that maybe we shouldn't be having plastic bottles of water uh, in, in uh, South Cams. So uh, that's a small point there, Chairman. But um, no, I enjoyed reading it. Very, very good. Very good. Excellent. Um, good. Should we? Uh, should we take all of the comments and then go through what, what we can do about those? Yes, is that okay, Siobhan? Yes, and there is a comment from um, uh, Councillor Ellington in the chat, which I can I can read out if you like. Or oh, it's Councillor Ellington, can you say it? it? Or can, no, Councillor Ellington should read it out, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Ellington. Thank you. I just want wanted reassuring that some of the uh, reductions that we've seen here is not merely a transference of responsibility and costs to staff and councillors who are working from home and using their own electricity and heating and space. Um, and that we are taking that into account. And I suppose the other thing that bothers me is always when we start talking about percentages 100% of nothing is nothing. And I really feel that I want to see the amount, and I want to see the amount it's reduced by, not the percentage. But that's just me, I suspect. I'm done. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Oh, apologies for the level of detail here, but on one of the red items, the taxi charging. Um, I, I note that the uh, Cambridge Ice Rink has a, a, a large excess of um, electric power capacity for technical reasons, and I wondered if um, that had been assessed as a site. Thank you. Any others? Councillor Khan. <coughs> um, I wanted to draw attention to what I was saying on the last uh, agenda item um, about the balance between climate is, uh, topics uh, uh, and doubling nature and how much smaller and how much more uh, lower in scale are the uh, doubling nature pro projects. If we're going to be serious about this, um, uh, and uh, I'm not trying to diminish at all the, uh, the climate projects, they're absolutely essential, but if we're going to be serious about it, that balance, we'll have to change this. Um, and there's going to have to be more consideration of how we how we fund it and how we, we do something in that field. Uh, uh, we do need to think perhaps about actual practical projects we might be able to get involved in, uh, if we're going to be serious about this. I'll tell you, as I said before, it's a matter of culture uh, and priority. Uh, uh, the, the office has been very good with the, 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 the framework that we, we provided, but we do need to think about this in the longer term, about how, how much directly involved we're going to be. Uh, I, as I commented, I was surprised as participant of the Freedom Park uh, Accelerator Project to find out that we were the only authority in, in, in Cambridgeshire which wasn't actually doing work, uh, much work on the ground, uh, didn't have a section doing work on the ground uh, on green areas. We, we just got it for, we just advised, but we don't have a practical role. Uh, now, now that's based on decisions in the past, but I think we do need to perhaps think about that again in our future. That's my own comment. Yes, Councillor Bear Park. 
Um, so one of the uh, tricky things sometimes with um, carbon savings is it can result in uh, kind of financial savings as well. And as one of the tricky things is the rebound effect. And um, I was just wondering if that's been considered at all in terms of where carbon savings may be made, such as LED lighting, which reduce, uh, result in um, electricity cost reductions. Um, are those savings effectively being reinvested? <laughs> we'll have to ask our parish councils. <laughs> but yes, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, good. And, and I, if Councillor Payne, do you have anything? Or are you okay? Uh, yes, if I may. Yep. Um, Chair, I, I found this extremely useful to see the, uh, particularly the, the RAG ratings of the various um, headings. One of the things that perhaps worth bearing in mind, however, is the enormous difference in the level of contribution which each of these items mm -hmm. will or potentially deliver and the timing of that contribution. And I think we need to be careful not to be too encouraged by ratings which are green if some of the ones which are red are actually rather more significant. A, a particular area I would have is um, some of those which are not coloured, for reasons which um, are explained in the report, I would mention in particular energy efficiency both in council housing but also in the private rented sector. And there's a particular issue here is that we have the responsibility, legal responsibility, for enforcing those new energy standards. And so whilst I accept the difficulties, I think we do have to look with some urgency how we can at least assess, which at this stage we've not been able to do, the potential for a contribution, uh, particularly from the private rented sector. Um, obviously, we will have to wait for certain government programs to be replaced um, before we can necessarily make progress on them. But we will make much faster progress if in the meanwhile we have at least been able to assess the, the impact and to consider what measures might be available to us. Thank you very much, Councillor Fain. Um, good, and I, I would just like to echo what is um, A6 and A7, which is about the private rental home. And just to understand if you could explain to us, um, Siobhan, does this mean that we've applied for the enforcement and compliance funding? Um, and what I understand is that if we don't get it, it's been taken out of our plan for the coming year in the new action plan, um, which means that we wouldn't be doing anything around it if we didn't have any funding to do anything around it. So there's a bit of an answer to what Councillor Bain is, is saying there. Um, and I would, um, I, I share with what Councillor Card is saying when we look at what we're doing around doubling nature and the fact that it is minor in a greatly to do with the fact that we don't have the, the land and we don't manage the land that we do have, which is very small. And I would look forward to having some proposals, Councillor Khan, as to how we can do this as my Vice Chair for Biodiversity and Nature. So we, I do really encourage you to bring that forward, especially from the accelerator project that you are there, because that gives us opportunity to perhaps do something with it. So I would like to, to see that coming forward further. Um, I do think I would like to understand a little bit more, um, Siobhan, on the electric vehicles, because we have that in there as A20, which is through planning policy. But given the detail in that A20 on, on this policy, I would just like to pose the question whether, again, we go back to having the possibility of an EV strategy for the district, because otherwise what it seems is it's coming through piecemeal, through development, um, and, and then, you know, that leads to problems because we don't actually have a, um, you know, a strategy for that overall. So we can't have a sense of where it's, where it's going. And, and I think somebody mentioned um, the figures. When we go into the greenhouse strategy um, accounting in the next item on our agenda, we can see in that report that despite COVID, which has meant that in other places emissions have gone down, ours haven't significantly. And we're actually doing less better than the year before. 
Now, there are lots of reasons for that, and one of the reasons um, for that, Councillor Ellington, I think is also about your point about, you know, this decision's now about active travel for our staff. And I think we're going to hear about whether or not it's better for, if you count it up overall, is it better to have staff here or to have everyone using all of those um, resources in their own homes? And I understand if you can explain a bit, Siobhan, we're looking at that's being looked at, isn't it? And the fact that even though we weren't in here, we were, this building was being used. So it was being used by the NHS 24 hour emergency care um, and others. So, you know, the, the costs still, um, the usages were there until we've got the complete green and clean energy, those are still being used. And that's good because they needed to use the place. So that, that's good. But how do we, you know, what do we do with that? Thank you, Siobhan. Do you want to come back on any so, of those? So, yes, I'll, I'll do what I can to come back on, on those points. It, it may be that Rebecca um, knows more about some of these um, uh, things. But in, in terms of the private rented sector, I wonder whether it would be a good idea to have um, our um, environmental health officers who are involved in this area to come and and talk to the, the um, committee about what the issues are here, really. And I, I mean, I, I know that as a rural area, um, it is very difficult to do this kind of work in a, a cost-effective way, but I'm by no means an expert on the exact details. And so I know that our environmental health officers are applying for a, 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 um, this particular fund or trying to put together a bid for this particular fund, as mentioned in the, um, the column there. Um, so perhaps they could come back and, um, and, and, and report on that. So that, that's one thing. I don't know if Rebecca's got anything. You may know more about it than I do. No, I think that's quite a sensible suggestion, actually, Siobhan, um, on that point. Thank you, and Rebecca. It might, yeah. it might be something that needs to be thought about for the business plan. It certainly is the kind of um, uh, work that won't necessarily be able to be done within existing resource, for sure. Um, uh, so that was one point. The electric vehicle strategy... Again, I think we've we've um, it is it's, we've struggled in that it's such a, a complicated picture in terms of the different responsibilities of other actors in this space, and particularly the GCP and the combined authority, and so uh, which makes it quite difficult to see our particular um, particular role. And those pieces are very much moving. Um, uh, uh, so, I, but again, I think. You know, perhaps we should come back to the committee with a, um, a closer update on what we can find out is happening at the other levels and what the what um, the what the options might be in terms of um, our role and what kind of resource that might need. That's perhaps the information that we need to work out whether that's an area that needs a bit more. You know, that that, that we want to look at more. Thank you. Um, and on the. At least two. I, I wondered that as well, Councillor Howell, which is about at least one tree. And I thought, oh, should it be at least one? I agree. You know, it was my first reaction. And, and I don't know whether what we're talking about there are small areas like, you know, in our sheltered housing or, or whatever, because it's about our council housing. But is that something Councillor Howell was putting forward? Should we at least say at least two because of doubling nature and the survival rate of trees? Should we be at least saying at least two for every one? Um, I, I feel like I've actually just worded this rather clumsily because what I do know very is that the, the commitment is absolutely there from housing to put in more trees and so they're, they're absolutely looking at two or more. Um, sometimes there simply isn't the space and so that's the issue. It's not, it's, it's, it's not to do with any, uh, you know, they, they, they want to put in more but sometimes it's not possible. I think that could be slightly better worded. But I suppose um, what, what is being brought here is if we do... You know, would we then commit to put, finding it where there is space? You know, that's the thing. Would we, if, if one's going, that we do... Yeah, so we have the process in place through housing to identify all the, hopefully, eventually, all of the potential opportunities where more trees and also more wildflowers can be planted. So that process has been set up and is, is, is in operation. Um, so I, I don't think it would add anything to, um, to, to put anything else in, in here um, because I think the process is already there. But could we change the wording on this one, Siobhan? Yes, we could. Yes, yes. yes. So, it shows, so it actually that. just shows our commitment. We're not doing yes. one for one. We are looking yeah. at increasing. Thank you very much. That was a, 
an, an important point. Perhaps Tom. Um, I, I particularly take the point about the problems with uh, supporting landlords and private sector. Uh, I should explain uh, to an interest that I actually have, uh, I, I've, I'm a landlord for some houses, but not in this area. Uh, and it's one of the things that has posed the question to me is how I can fund, um, how I can justify funding improvements to uh, energy efficiency for houses that, that I own. Uh, I've done a, a couple of, I've done some small things. The minimum standard required at present is uh, really quite a, a poor standard. I think it's level E, which is um, really uh, pretty poor. Uh, it has to be really bad house, um, building to get to that standard. Uh, and we should be obviously looking, hoping for a higher, higher, higher target. But um, I think it is something we do need to look at, and particularly in, is how you might do it. The, the public schemes that were put forward were not sufficiently attractive, really, for many landlords to do it. Um, it was sometimes done, for instance, it was sensible if you were having an aerial renewal scheme in an urban area, but that's not really the sort of thing that applies in our, in our, in our district. Um, so you really do need to think of ways that uh, provide an incentive, because the problem, of course, is that the landlord invests in the, in the improvements and it's the tenant that gets the benefits. And so the, there's not really a financial benefit for the landlord in the same way there is for a private house owner. Um, so, uh, and unless there is um, a larger scale of public support, it's going to be difficult for, uh, to persuade people to do it. Um, so I, I, I look forward to ideas, really, of how that might improve. I, I've been a bit challenged myself coming forward with them. Good, thank you. And I know it's caused kind of, yes, even, um, let, let's ha make sure that we have a, a session on that. Councillor Harvey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just addressing Councillor Carr's point, I wonder if within our wide portfolio, either it's um, indirectly via Ermine Street with our direct um, housing stock, um, there's room to uh, at least pilot um, heat as a service because if we could convince uh, private landlords that that was a viable thing to do, then of course, the benefits of extra insulation will come back to the landlord, um, and that would be a way forward. So, note that down for our little, if we have a session on that, that's something we can discuss. Thank you very much. Can I um, also, just a couple of recommendations that we may then need to take forward to our next business plan, but in terms of our new action plan that we have here, um, for us to think about. And one is, um, skills and sort of green skills so we talk about education we talk about helping business but we are also sort of looking at how we can be involved with um, green skills sort of promotion and so i think it'd be good to reflect that we are already starting to take you know have conversations with our business development officers and with the regional colleges and universities and greater cambridge partnership so i think if we can reflect that here if, if, if indeed we do um, take that forward in some ways and then um also i would like to see how we reflect the work on, on the Oxcam Arc that's happening, you know, and I don't know if that's through planning or, or what it's through in terms of the sections we have here, but somehow we're also showing that we are not only pushing it through our local plan, but we're pushing it through the environmental principles and seeing how that's, that's implemented. And then thirdly, on 3.8 in terms of um, committee action, it was about the climate and environment fortnight, and that was very, very you know, successful and a lot of hard work that you put into that. Um, it's just to, to let everyone know that I was recently elected to be the Local Government Association Deputy Chair of the Policy Board nationally on Environment, Economy, Housing and Transport for the Liberal Democrats. These are cross-party boards, so they've got Conservative, um, Labour and Independent. So um, I'm part of the Climate Change Task Force, which has the leaders of the Conservatives and Labour, Independent and Liberal Democrats, which is looking at the build-up to COP26 and meeting with the ministers who are champions for COP26 for each of their sectoral departments. And one of the things being discussed is whether we do local COP26s in our area in a way to bring in businesses um, and communities to showcase what we're doing at local level as well. And I was just wondering, and the timing is not exact there, Siobhan, but it doesn't matter in terms of exactly the timing around November. You know, it could still be early next year, and it could be our COP26. So Warwickshire and Coventry are doing one. Um, that's Conservative-led uh, Warwickshire and Coventry. They're going to do a joint double authority COP26 locally. And so it's a way of bringing in businesses again to say, what can we all be doing together to get to net zero? 
So that's an idea maybe of a, a way that we could theme that. Um, yes, perhaps we'll say. So I wonder whether there's an opportunity now for doing something jointly with the combined authority because uh, you know, the combined authority is giving every indication of um, moving into the sort of climate and environment space far more than it has done in the past. So I think you know, we need to uh, just you know, not necessarily be going it alone here because uh, you know, they, they do have money for a start. And of course, you know, the, the whole climate issue isn't, it doesn't stop at our boundaries, does it? So I think there, would, there are opportunities for us to be working collaboratively with the combined authority there. Excellent. And I, do, I don't know if you heard today's local news that uh, the Fenland Peak Project just received £7 million from the lottery today as well, wow. which is quite, quite exciting. Wow, that's huge. Um, <laughs> yes, and so, and ending on that point, um, which is going to be my last one, which is. And, and having Councillor Smith with us. So the combined authority just adopted the recommendations from the Independent Climate Commission for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. And among those were a 2030 target for the combined authority itself. And among there were also a commitment for local councils to have aspiring targets that also equal 2030 and start to consider what are the pathways to a more ambitious target. So I would like us to start considering how we locally now look at those. Considering, and this was interesting, I was in a call with all of the other councils, constituents, and even the more rural councils, all of us, for the greatest majority of our emissions are from our waste group. So how do we get that to 2030? You know, the, so these are really in, the important, interesting questions that are real. You know, so it's some things you can do, some things you can push as fast as you can, others can't. Maybe working together with economies of scale are ways that we do this, but I would like to invite us to now look at how we, as a council, consider what that would mean for us if we were to go for a 2030 target. And what we have done is we've been very, very serious about our targets. We haven't done any sort of um, gesture politics, I would say. You know, officers have been very serious. If we're taking on a binding target, that we can do it. And we can see it in this report as well and, and in the next agenda item where we're reporting on it and seeing how we're doing it. So I think it's going to be a challenging but important piece of work to look at that. Um, so I would like to make that proposal to the members in the room that that is a piece of work we would need to take on. By affirmation, yeah. Thank you very much. Where it's inextricably linked with the natural the nature side of that. Thank you. We'll go on to, thank you very much, Siobhan, for that excellent report. We do like your action plan, the new one. And can we go to agenda item seven now, which is the greenhouse gas emissions? Ah, oh, I did have one thing, sorry. When we looked at the progress with the paperless and moved to digital, so I saw that Cabinet now has moved to digital, apart from one member who is new, it said. I don't know if Councillor Smith can help us with that. How do we see this as our committee? Can we go digital? Can we go digital? Our committee. Do we need papers, published papers? And I know there's an access issue. I know Councillor Ellington is saying yes. When you're, when you're standing in, Councillor Ellington. So what it, maybe an opt-in rather than an opt-out option. Chairman, um, the council have gone digital quite a while ago, so it's, up to, it's a bit of a pain to get used to, but we get used to it now. Councillor Smith. Uh, so, ca so Cabinet's been doing a pilot on, on being, being paperless, and um, yeah, it's, you know, we, we can't think we've got there now. Not easy, but I think we have got, we have just about got there, 95%. Following on from Councillor Smith's comments regarding cabinet um, paperless, certainly um, the aspiration would be for other groups from within the council and other committees and other members across the League of the Members to go paperless. I'm sure, ultimately, um, it may require um, that members. Um, Sorry, can you speak? Oh, into a microphone a bit more. Sorry, can you hear me better now? Thank you. Um, it may require some further work behind the scenes regarding the support that would be required in terms of resourcing um, hardware, for instance. Um, but certainly work has taken place behind the scenes using the Modgov app that all of us are familiar with. Um, so that soft approach is certainly happening at the moment. 
if I had to speak with you further regarding the practicality of the method. Yeah, I, what I saw from everyone in the room is we're happy to take it to that next stage to discuss the practicalities of it. And we are listening to you, Councillor Ellington, to see, you know, make sure that whoever does need access could have access, but otherwise we'll, we'll take that next step. I, I just want to make a little hesitant comment that I look forward to reading my paper documents. It's about the only thing I read in paper in my council documents. Uh, I find it much easier to read in paper. Uh, and I do see the benefits of going paperless, but I also see the, the, hand, uh, the handicap. I find it affects my eyesight a bit, always looking at the screen. Uh, um, I may well end up, if we go paperless, printing out a lot of the documents at home. So it's just a little hesitation about that. Thank you. I'd just like to take us on to the first page of the action plan. Use of paper in our offices has plummeted from 420 boxes of A4 and 36 boxes of A3 in the first two quarters of 2019 to 80 boxes of A4 and zero boxes of A3 in the first two quarters of 2020. And again, largely because of home working. Um, I, and again, it says maybe one or two printing at home is fine, you know, um, and that's a cost. To, but it, so it could be an opt-in. So it could be as an access issue in terms of equality that and equity that people who do need it can have it, but it doesn't mean that everybody has it because some need it. So if we could take that to the next stage, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Good. Thank, thank you very much. So if we go to agenda item seven, um, which are our greenhouse gas emissions accounts. You do, but Emma, you're. Yes. Hello, Hi. Emma Dyer. Um, thank you very yeah. much. Hi, I'm just going to share my screen first of all, so yep. hopefully you should be able to see that graph, is that correct? Yeah, so this is where, this is what we're saying we're going to do, and then this is what's really happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, this is an overview of the greenhouse gas emission accounts for the Council's estate and operations for 2020-21. It is provided to show our current status and where we are in relation to delivering a reduction in our carbon footprint of at least 45% by 2025, and at least 75% by 2030. So before I start, I just want to let you know that all figures quoted in the report and the formulas used to calculate the figures have been checked through by our internal auditors and an external assurance statement has been now completed. So, so that's all great. Um, so yeah, I'm pleased to report that there's been an overall 8.8% decrease, decrease in emissions when compared to our baseline year. And the baseline year being 1st of April 2018 to the 31st of March 2019. This is a 10.7% decrease in emissions on last year, which is great news. However, to be on track to reach our targets, we need a 6.25% reduction in emissions every year until 2030. So we are very slightly behind, but with our greening of South Cam's full work, which we've mentioned, I'm confident we will reach our target. So just to clarify for those who don't know, the greenhouse gas um, data that we compile every year is separated out into scopes. So we have our scope one emissions, which are our direct emissions, such as emissions from gas and fleet diesel. We have our scope two emissions, which are our indirect energy emissions. So basically all our electricity usage, including street lamp consumption figures. We have our scope three emissions, which are other indirect emissions. And these are the result of activities from assets not owned or controlled by the council that have an impact on its value chain. So our current approach is to include data which is readily available to us, um, in which case we include the emissions associated with business travel. And as you can see from the graph, I have combined scopes one and two in blue and scope three in orange to see the difference in our emissions since 2018 and 19. So if I just go through the, um, the scopes one by one, scope one emissions um, are pretty similar to our baseline year. The percentage decrease in combustion for gas, for space and water heating at South Cam's Hall and our small sites was calculated as 10.5%, which is fantastic. This is most likely attributed to an overall reduction in heating to reflect the shorter working days of staff working in the office since the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the decrease in diesel fuel consumption is minus 1.33% on the previous year. This is despite an increase in diesel consumption by fleet vehicles due to the increased number of new housing developments. So without the introduction of an extra electric bin lorry in November 2020, this number would have increased. So that, that's, that's good news, obviously. Um, scope 2 emission decreases could be due to several factors. So given that the Council's Scope 2 emissions are related to electricity usage, a likely explanation is 
Firstly, the rollout of the LED footway light upgrade, which is almost complete. And secondly, an overall reduction in electricity usage, again, most likely due to the shorter working days of staff working from South Cams Hall since the COVID-19 pandemic. Scope 3 emission decreases, as you would expect, are due to a significant decrease in staff mileage, down 55.3% on the previous year, due to an increase, again, in home working due to COVID-19. Um, our avoided electricity figures have also increased since the 2019-20 baseline. It shows a positive impact on the Council's total net carbon emissions. Included this year are avoided figures from a green tariff introduced in all of the small sites owned by the Council, plus a full year of data from South Cams Hall. Just to note that last year we only um, included six months of data from the green tariff at South Cams Hall. And Currently, the Council, along with Cambridgeshire City Council, are investigating the possibility of including a share of the carbon emissions produced by the three C ICT servers located in both Pathfinder House in Huntingdon and Sand Martin House in Peterborough. And if agreed, this figure will be included as an additional Scope 3 category in next year's report, along with a baseline recalculation. And finally, a new risk, which is called failure to meet carbon emission reduction target, was added by internal audit in November 2020 following the actions highlighted from the internal audit carbon management report. Um, um, thank you for listening. Any questions? I will um, unshare my screen. Oh, has that been done? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Councillor Bear. Councillor, thank you very much, Emma. Councillor Bear Park. Thank you. Um, Chair, I have a comment and a question. So, a comment just in terms of the target for South Cams. Um, obviously, as a fast growing region this is going to be more challenging for us than other districts um, and I suppose um, Emma you, you one of the points you made was about waste and waste collection and that's one of the biggest aspects and that waste collection is going to go up in proportion with the amount of housing we have so I suppose one of the things is you know what can we do to minimize the waste collection needs within the district um, the other one was about a question about the methodology, really, of the calculations, because I came across something from local partnerships, uh, which was the Greenhouse Gas Accounting Pool, um, only last week, actually, um, and, uh, and they've been working with the LGA. Um, and I just wondered if, you're, if, if, the, if you've come across that tool before and whether that's something you've seen or used, because apparently it allows you to do benchmark against other... Um, other councils to see how you're doing versus other councils. Yes, that, I mean, I, I'm, I am aware of that, actually. It was actually partly through me writing my report that I was made aware of it. So what I wanted to do was obviously completed what I did and then um, investigate that at a further date. I do know that the senior auditor that was looking at the report was aware of it as well. Um, and I think she said there were a few limitations, but obviously I can't comment because I've not seen it myself. So it's something that we will perhaps we will look into for next year. But obviously, because the report was halfway through, we didn't want to sort of change what we were doing halfway through. So it is something we're aware of. Um, and with, with, that, with your comments on waste, um, obviously one of our plans is to continue the sort of introduction of more electric bin lorries. Um, I think Rebecca probably could tell me a bit more about these plans. I think, is it five per year or five in total in the next five years, maybe, I think? Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, I was just going to ch check clarification on the question, really. So yeah, em Emma's right in that, um, obviously, we, we have now got a set plan for the uh, purchasing um, of more um, electric vehicles into the fleet. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll have another, by this time next year, we'll have another two. Um, so that, that kind of plan is in place and that does take account um, of, um, you know, the growth of the additional vehicles that will be needed because of that growth. But I think the question might have been about general amount of waste that we're also collecting and how we're dealing with that. And um, to my mind, um, in terms of all the waste that we collect, it has it directly relates to carbon. Um, there is a, a particular attention that needs to be paid to uh, food waste. And this probably was picked up at the last VIC, actually, when um, um, a partnership manager um, came to present about the um, national waste strategy consultations. And one of the things that obviously that is coming up as part of that um, national waste strategy approach is um, the push to increase our food waste collections. And the reason that the food waste collections are so important is because 
that's what um, generates a lot of emissions when that biodegradable material it gets into waste disposal. So the more that we can capture food waste um, as part of our recycling collections, the better. Um, and the more that you can recycle it and not dispose of it, it, it will, will help with those emissions. So that's what we've already kind of had a, um, a start on and we're doing a trial and the National Waste Strategy will indeed be encouraging um, not just us, but all councils to go down that route. So, um, and that in turn will obviously minimise the amount of general rubbish that we collect. And one of the beautiful things about collecting food waste for recycling is that it has this um, additional um, uh, innate sort of inbuilt educational effect on residents because suddenly um, they can see how much food waste they're generating and waste, waste reduction or food waste reduction goes hand in hand with the recycling collection. So, um, yeah, conversely, but it does. So not only will, are we confident that we'll be able to sort of capture more food waste recycling, but we probably will be able to reduce how much people throw away, which is ultimately where you want to be in the waste hierarchy. So we want to be reducing the amount we collect. Does that help? Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Those are exactly the lines I was thinking along with. It's yeah. you know, things where we can, you know, we might do which might make people more aware, for instance, of the food waste, of the, of the food that they're wasting and therefore gradually yeah. reduce it and waste less and similarly with other things such as plastics i'm always shocked how much goes into my how full my blue bin is every week and yeah. uh, just kind of maybe educational things about how to reduce the amount of the amount of waste could be helpful as well back on thank you chairman um just want to ask a quick question page 23 um paragraph 17 the decrease in staff mileage was 55.3% in the previous year, due to an increase of home working due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Can I just ask, please, with regards to that um, figure, um, I'm, I'm, um, is there any sort of breakdown that we have on that? I'm assuming most of it is down to housing officers and planning officers going out to look at different um, uh, things around the, 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 um, the district. But also, with regards to the travel to work plan, what is it that people coming into work as well, I mean, coming in a fair distance, some people do. Um, is there any way that we can reconfigure or do things that would help them? So, for example, if we have somebody who lives to the south of the county, would it, would it be something that they, we could look at maybe putting the planning areas that they work in in the south so that they can come into work not live to the south of the district and then have to have their patch into the north. I mean, I don't know, these are long terms and managerial issues, but just things such as that I'm thinking of. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I just respond? Um, so when it, with regards to the mileage, so we have it broken down into obviously the business mileage from the staff themselves going out to meetings, going to work, everything like, well, sorry, um, the, the mileage they claim when they go to a meeting, say. Also, the zip car mileage, um, which I think was pretty much zero this year because nobody's been using the zip car. And also the councillors, the, the, the mileage that the councillors, when you go to your meetings as well, you, you claim back. So it's three components, basically. Um, and I know that there was a travel to work policy. I believe that um, one of our officers is working on at the moment. I think it's been delayed due to COVID. So I think it's obviously all this active travel and everything is actually... Um, it, it, it is something that's been worked on at the moment. So um, Siobhan might know a little bit more about, about what's going well, on there. Just really to add that the, 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 uh, we are very aware that things are different following the, um, the pandemic and it just has, has, has kind of made so many things different in the way that people think about things. And so this is very much being thought about in a much uh, um, more all-encompassing way than um, had previously been envisaged. So. Um, Susan Gardner Craig, head, head of HR, is um, is leading on that. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, just a small thing. And can I ask then that um, Sharon and everyone here has um, sight of the travel to work plan, or at least has the opportunity to comment upon it before it is then put forward towards um, uh, the appropriate portfolio holder. Thank you. Yep, that, that's a quick that's a proposal which I would support, which is we do get a sighting and an ability to feed into the, the 
um, travel to work plan that's being looked at. And I think that's in the round, it's mentioned here, it's in the round in terms of, you know, looking at all of the emissions within the building if you're coming into work or you're working at home and the travel too as well. I think that's sort of combined, isn't it? But yes, it would be lovely if we could have a site of that. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that, that up with um, the people involved here. Thank you. Good. Um, I, I would like to note, and I think Councillor Harvey would be very interested in this, I see that on um, page 23, uh, number 19, as I understand, what we're being told is that streaming and internet use within 10 years will be greater than aviation emissions. And so what we have looked at is, in a way, we've sort of, because we've got this shared data center and it's outside our area, you know, the question I think you posed to us, Councillor Harvey, is are we accounting for it? And as I understand, this is going to be included, you know, as a shared accounting distributed proportionally amongst the different councils. This is going to be a new addition and therefore a recalculation in here. Is that right? That's what we're, yeah, hopefully we need to get the data together, but yes, that's the plan. Good, because I think that's, I mean, that's also going to perhaps, you know, with, within terms of the digital working, that's going to be something we'd, you know, we'd need to look at as well, but that's good. Thank you very much for that. And I think what it shows us again is the pace at which we're doing this. We're not at 6% a year, but we never thought it was going to be a linear thing. We thought some things were going to accelerate us towards our um, 2025 target anyway, such as the Green Your South plans. Um, but we, we do need to do more, and especially if we're going to think about a more ambitious target, we've got to look at that very seriously and just see you know, what's, what's possible. But thank you very much for that. Again, an excellent report. Um, we go on to agenda item eight, um, and this is another critical infrastructure issue, which is about the grid capacity issues facing Cambridge, which are also, they, they are critical in terms of the development that's happening and how it's happening, but also they unlock the possibilities for renewable energy. And Emma Davis, excellent report you've got here. Thank you for staying with us and waiting for this <laughs> time to come through, Emma. Um, our sustainability expert, if you'd like to present this report. Thank you, Chair. So I thought I'd just very quickly take you through um, what's in the report uh, before moving on to any questions uh, that you have. So basically the paper is to provide you with an update on progress with work to address uh, grid infrastructure capacity issues across South Cambridgeshire and Cambridge as well. So some previous work that was carried out a few years ago by the Greater Cambridge Partnership indicated that we needed to uh, treble capacity on the grid in order to support the current growth agenda. So the level of growth allocated in our 2018 local plans for both South Cambridgeshire and Cambridge, and also the electrification of transport. So as part of this work, it did identify that in particular development to the west and south of Cambridge was quite limited, partly because of a, a kind of lack of infrastructure in that area. So Greater Cambridge Partnerships are currently progressing some work to extend this infrastructure um, in that part of, of South Cambridgeshire. So there's going to be an eastern extension, which will allow further growth uh, to the east and south of Cambridge. And then there's also going to be a western extension which will provide additional capacity to the west of Cambridge, including development at Bourne Airfield and Camborne. So that's some work that's been progressing uh, by the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Um, I am involved in the project board for that work, along with some other colleagues um, from Cambridge City. In addition to that work as well, we've been thinking about what further work we're also going to need to support the development of the new local plan, the Greater Cambridge local plan, because obviously that plan has got some quite strong ambitions around things like net zero carbon. That will all be coming through committee in due course, so you'll learn a little bit more about that then. But what we've done so far as part of our infrastructure delivery plan for that local plan has been some very high level work on grid capacity, which has identified that there will need to be further reinforcement to um, help support 
additional growth in the area and some of the ambitions that we have around the transition to net zero carbon. What we now need to look at once we've got a clear understanding of where we're going in terms of our preferred options for the amount of growth and our kind of spatial strategy. So where we're going to be looking at that growth going is that we need to carry out a little bit more detailed work to look at what grid capacity is to support that preferred option that can identify at a very high level what additional capacity might be required um, and as part of that work as well I have also tried to sneak in um, a little bit of wording around supporting the wider transition to net zero carbon obviously in planning we're focused on new development but obviously there is going to be wider decarbonisation as well of our existing settlements and existing transport um, so that's just a very brief overview of what's in the report that you've, you've had in your agenda packs uh, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Councillor Harvey. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yes, in respect of the um, inability of UK power networks to build ahead of need, and I notice that particular point is addressed in, in Rio EB2, which I think is uh, coming to force in 2023. So I'm hoping that we're going to sort of progress quickly enough with this plan um, that it doesn't become obsoleted by that. I also wondered, um, is there any danger that we could be in a sort of invidious position where lack of grid capacity um, causes a block on a, on a sort of major housing development, which is critical to our five-year land supply. And, you know, that could be quite an awkward situation to be in. So that's part of the reason why the GCP project is currently underway. It is to make sure that we don't end up in a situation where, you know, a housing development can't come forward. Now, what UK power networks will always tell you is that they can always provide that additional capacity. But it is just a question of having to pay for that and then how long it takes to bring those projects forward. So I think that has partly influenced why the GCP are actually now looking to invest ahead of need. They have now made an application to UK power networks to get more detailed costings on the first phases of this project. So we are specifically looking to avoid any issues where, you know, because of the amount of time it can sometimes take to deliver these projects. So we're talking about delivery of new substations and they can take, you know, three years or so to kind of plan and deliver. So that's specifically what this project is looking to overcome. It's also not duplicating anything that's in the new business plan uh, that, that UK Power Networks have just produced and colleagues at Greater Cambridge Partnership have got a very close working relationship with the UK Power Networks on this project. So, you know, it's, it's being delivered kind of in addition to some of those works. Thank you. Any other? Councillor Deerpark. Um, I have a question about new infrastructure and um, um, sulfur hexafluoride in use in some of the installations because it's the strongest greenhouse gas, like 100 times stronger than um, carbon dioxide. And I was wondering if we can ensure <laughs> through the GCP that we're not building an infrastructure with that particular chemical in it. Um, whether that's possible or not, I don't know, but I wondered whether it might be worth uninitiated, which bit of it is, is, is that of the building? That's in a substation and transformers primarily, um, where it's used as, as part of the insulating material. But it's, it's a big issue because it's such a strong greenhouse gas. I have learned something new. <laughs> I was not aware of that issue. Um, I think that's certainly something, if you could provide a little bit more information, I could possibly take through to colleagues in GCP just to just to highlight it as a problem and to see if there's anything that can be done uh, with current technologies to, I suppose, design that chemical out of the process. 
um, it's a new area for me, I have to say. So I'm not sure if there is an alternative um, available, but we could certainly ask the question. Yeah, I'll certainly send you some information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Good. And, and this is, I mean, so critical. So for the first time ever for our new local plan, as you know, the, the evidence base that's coming up is looking at kind of a carbon costing in a way, sort of what are the carbon emissions implications of all of the different spatial strategy options that we're looking at. Um, but as you say, on top of that, if, if we do decide on something which then needs all of the renewable energy options, which can't then be connected into the grid or turn out to be too expensive to connect it in the grid, then we're building white elephants and we're just increasing our emissions. So, you know, um, and, as, and I think it's fantastic, Emma, that you've included, as you were saying, what's going to happen in terms of the retrofitting. So, you know, what burden will, what we hope will be a huge retrofitting program, um, if, the, if the government could support that across the country, what extra burden would that then bring on to, you know, our grid capacity as well? That would be key. So thank you very much for keeping us updated on this, and we're, we're very happy to, to hear what's happened and that we're looking forward as well. So thank you. You're welcome. And we go on to um, item number nine, which is the A428 environmental legacy update. Um, Siobhan, you're here with us. This, this sort of the history on this as well is kind of on, on the A14, there was quite a lot to be desired in the way that that was both designed and executed and what its environmental legacy has been. And we've heard today as well about the plastics and also about the dead trees. Um, and so we had hoped that lots of the lessons learned could be applied to what's happening now for the A428. And I know that officers are spending a lot of time. The other reason that I asked for this agenda to come is even though there is the work with the legacy committee, I understand that we are quite concerned that there's very low ambition by Highways England in general for the A428 in terms of, of environmental standards. And so that's why we wanted it to come here, just to really understand the situation. Thank you, Siobhan. So, uh, um, thank you, Chair. Um, so, I'll just go through what is in, um, uh, in the report quite um, uh, briefly, and then if you'd like to ask any questions. But, um, yes, yeah, so this, this the, as you all know, the A428 Black Cats, Cats and Gibbet Works, Gibbet Works are um, a nationally significant infrastructure project of NSIP. And as such, they require a development consent order um, following uh, an examination process conducted by the planning inspectorate. Um, so there's, there's two aspects to the um, environmental legacy work. One is the aspect which is being um, uh, uh, coordinated by our planning officer, Chengid Taravinga, and um, involves our representations um, which are um, coordinated together with representations from all the Cambridgeshire local authorities and go via the county council um, on the um, Highways England's application. And um, council officers are uh, from uh, many different services are involved in this and have indicated uh, many areas of in, concern in the proposed scheme, um, areas around biodiversity, landscape, air quality, cultural heritage, flooding and drainage and climate change um, uh, have, have all um, uh, brought forward um, um, comments. Um, and then there is an initial meeting with the planning inspectorate in, uh, well, uh, in late, late July, I think it's probably going to be in August now. Um, so that process is, uh, is, is, is taking place. Um, they, the actual comments are online, and I should perhaps have provided the link. I can, I can do that if people would be interested yes. to read yes, those please, comments. Yeah. The, the other thing to say, actually, is that um, Emma, if she's still with us, Emma Davies, may be able to help in answering further questions on that. She's been more involved in that. So as, as well as that, we have been um, uh, working with Highways England in um, legacy benefits officer 
to help um, to, to try and make the most of the Highways England's um, uh, legacy funding. And so uh, we th this the, the, the legacy funding is a, a, a large national fund, uh, 936 million on a countrywide basis for, for five years. And so the process for this is that you, um, you, you put in bids, the, the, where bids are from uh, uh, more than one organization working together, that always, always helps. So we're working with Hi Highways England on a bid um, to the environment and well-being part of this fund. And then within that uh, environment and well-being uh, stream, it's, it's, it's a further kind of um, subdivision uh, which is around carbon. And um, a proposal is being developed for feasibility funding, that's the, the, the stage we'd be at first under the carbon theme, to work with a specialist um, consultant such as the Environment Bank who worked with us on um, North Stoke to identify potential landowners and stewards in the proximity of the A428 project who would then manage land to maximize carbon sequestration, um, probably in mainly tree planting, but not necessarily um, limited to tree planting. And so we are um, um, working that that bid should go in fairly shortly. Um, we are also um, contributing to a process which is being coordinated by consultants working on behalf of Highways England um, to put in, to, to get funding for um, biodiversity options. So that, uh, that part of the legacy funding is, um, is being coordinated on a, um, a, a Cambridgeshire-wide process and our, um, um, our planning, our ecologist in the planning department is, um, uh, um, is, 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 is part of that process to, to, to see what we can get for South Cairns in that also. So you know, there a, a number of uh, uh, areas of work that, 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 are, that are happening. Good. Thank, thank you very much, Siobhan. And it's good to see that Emma could answer questions. I, I mean, we do need the link, because I would be very, very good for us to see the, the comments that have been done. But one thing are, are the legacy funds. But the legacy funds are additional complementary. And, and if the actual standards for, for this road, after everything that's happened with the A14, and we do not have good enough standards for what's going to happen with the A428, that, that is just terrible. And I think, you know, we need to take this further beyond what a technical officer comments. We have to actually take this, you know, strongly to, to Highways England, you know, and to the public. Because if nothing has been learned, and, and what I was in one of those conversations, and then I saw that in the, the planning reforms, it had taken out the national infrastructure projects from any of the biodiversity net gain um, um, obligations. I understand that's now been put back in again because of a result of um, everybody sort of saying that's, that's, that shouldn't happen. They should follow all of the standards that are national standards. We still have to see what comes out in the final version. But here locally, we have to insist that this, this infrastructure project is of the high quality standard we expect. Um, I saw Councillor Smith and Councillor Howell. Thank you. So I can give you an update. Um, Cabinet had a really excellent presentation from Chenge yesterday. Uh, so very, very unusually, the inspector who's dealing with the DCO application has gone back to Highways England to ask for answers to the, the points that we have, we and other councils have raised. So there have been grave concerns from this council, Huntingdonshire, and the county council particularly on biodiversity and also on the negative impact on sustainable uh, transport routes mm -hmm. such as footpaths, bridleways and cycleways. So um, it, that, is, that is almost unheard of for the inspector to go back. Um, on the biodiversity where well, they were claiming 20.5% net gain, but it now transpires that they are not using the latest up-to-date DEFRA methodology. And actually, you, uh, if, you, if we use the current methodology, it, you, it's difficult to prove that there isn't a net loss. So this is really, really serious. And uh, the information that Chenge gave us yesterday is that Highways England are being very um, slow 
at, to come back to the inspector to actually, you know, to, to, to pick this up and to start addressing these issues. So we're fairly out of love with Highways England, quite honestly, at the moment. Um, but, you know, there are three councils equally concerned, and we are, we decided in Cabinet yesterday, and it's currently with our Chief Executive, we will be escalating this. And I raised it with the MP for South Cambridgeshire yesterday as well. So, you know, it's just about as bad as it, bad as it could be, quite honestly. And those of us who've sat through death by PowerPoint from Highways England will know that it's a very, very much a one-way flow of information. And there, I can see uh, Emma laughing. Uh, they, they are incredibly reluctant to address uh, queries and, and issues from us. It, you know, really, yeah, they're really not, they're not listening, basically. So we are escalating this matter. Governor. Thank you, Chairman. I, I am really pleased to hear that. Um, I mean, as much as the 428 upgrade is vitally needed between Caxton and also the Black Cat, um, at the same time, it shouldn't be at all costs. It's got to be um, have a, a, a good effect for, the, for this particular area. Um, so that's, that's a very, very good update. I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, there, were, there was many questions asked about that, and I won't go on to them but, all, but there's just a small one, for example. There's a small little stream subsidiary um, called Hen Brook, and there was questions asked about that, for example, quite some time ago. Uh, and Highways England couldn't come back. And we just thought, well, come on, this is this is an impact on a village and several other villages down the line, and they still couldn't do that. So, so that's very good. Um, I don't want to keep on banging on about this, but we always keep on using the term lessons learnt, lessons learnt. Well, lessons learnt of the Papworth bypass is that 10, 15 years later, you've got plastic cover still around the trees. So my question would be, uh, when we go forward with this and we do that, that my les the lesson that we've learned is who's going to remove them, do they need to be removed, can they be biodegradable in the future, which would be much better because then we don't need to remove them and they can just go into the ground and hopefully feed the trees that they are protecting. So that would be a big thing that I would be looking for for the future. Small point, but something I think will have an implication when the workmen have, and women have gone from the site. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Matt Parker. Uh, a, brief, a brief question, uh, uh, Councillor Smith. Um, you said about uh, Huntingdon, Cambridgeshire, and ourselves objecting. Um, the, the route goes on into the Bedfordshire. Uh, I'm just wondering what the response was in Bedfordshire. Uh, so I think um, so. Bedford, Bedfordshire have uh, concerns, but I don't think they're quite as coterminous with our our concerns in in Bedfordshire. So I think you know we 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 stick with our kind of. You know, gang of gang of three here to put a very strong strong voice. Good. Um, do you want to add anything there, Emma? I think the only thing I would say, I've shared a link in the chat to the relevant representations on the Planning Inspectorate website, and you can actually search by um, local authority. Um, I think from what I've seen in terms of issues such as climate and ecology, we're probably the ones putting the most resource into representations related to those areas. Um, so, so Dan on the kind of biodiversity front is putting in a huge amount of work uh, alongside their you know, colleagues in landscape architecture as well. So I think we're probably the ones making the most representations I think Natural England have also got various representations in relation to, to some of those issues as well. But it has been a, uh, an interesting uh, process, and I would concur with the death by PowerPoint point. Although we, we did have a slightly more constructive meeting with um, Highways England last week on climate change. Um, so we're, we're making some small progress. Yeah, um, and, and we've just we've just sort of finished a, a sort of a, a summary of what again our lessons a bit like Papworth, but the ones on the A14 junctions near to my wards as well, and found that actual implementation of what had been promised has been far from you know what was expected as well. So it's this longer term um, side of this. 
in terms of legacy. So the, the legacy is great, and we do need to go for that because those funds are important, and the very air quality and the carbon ones, really, really important because those are good funds. But we've got to make sure the basics are right. And so it's, and it's very, very good to have that update, Councillor Smith. Um, and I think several of our communities would be very um, happy to hear that as well. This is taken up seriously. Thank you very much for that. And uh, if Siobhan could share the link, we don't have teams at the moment here with us, but if you could share that link with us, the members who are in the room, if you just share that to members of the committee, Siobhan, by email, that would be great. And agenda item news. number 10, six feet, instead of three free trees, six free trees, which I find <laughs> even harder to say. So the six <laughs> free tree scheme, um, Emma Dyer, please. So as you say, this is um, a quick update on the six free trees scheme, which will be offered to all parish councils in the next couple of months to support community action on climate change. So just as background information, I'll provide a brief run through of the three free trees scheme, which was launched by the council at the end of 2019. So this scheme was sufficient for three bare root trees, but parishes could also opt for a larger single tree to suit their needs if this was preferred. Parishes could apply to us for a voucher, which could be exchanged for trees at a selection of garden centres in South Cambridgeshire. And we also gave an option for an online based supplier in, in Northbrook. Trees needed to be planted on parish council land or, if agreed, land owned by South Cambridgeshire District Council, Cambridgeshire County Council or a local charity. And when no suitable land was available, parishes could donate their voucher to a neighbouring parish. In total, um, 54 parishes took up the offer and this equated to a total cost of 3,360, including sundries. So this year, in line with the council's aspiration to double nature, the council will be offering every parish in the district six free trees to continue this work to increase the tree canopy cover in South Cambridgeshire. This time, parish councils will be offered the six free trees from a wholesale supplier, and this is likely to result in higher quality trees and better value for money, as it will be a bulk order and will also make the scheme easier to administer. And the supplier will also offer an after-sale service if any issues arise. So a choice of native trees will be offered, which can either be pot-grown or bare-rooted to order directly through our chosen supplier. And um, since I wrote the report, please note that this may end up being two suppliers, as some suppliers will only offer um, some um, pot grown trees we want to obviously broaden that sort of you know scope as to what we can offer um, but obviously this is dependent on the quotes that we're going to receive um, this has gone out to our um, ITQ quotes um, tender um, portal and the deadline for quotes will be the middle of August and as with last year parishes will be given the option to choose one larger tree to the same value as the smaller trees where this suits their needs um, and this time the chosen supplier will deliver the trees directly to those parishes wishing to take up the offer and delivery arrangements will be arranged by both the parish councils and the supplier at the time of ordering and this will be hopefully during National Tree Week which is the 27th of November to the 5th of December 2021 and um, this is where possible otherwise before the end of um, December 2021. And lastly, it is expected that parishes will be able to apply for their free trees from September to allow suppliers enough time to source the chosen trees. So that's hopefully the plan at the moment. So, yeah, <laughs> any questions on that one? <laughs> Councillor Smith. Thank you. This is kind of my pet project here. And I, the next time it will, it will not be a tongue twister. It always, end, always seems to be a tongue twister. So I dread having to talk on the radio about it. Uh, so, I mean, what really pleases me is, well, Firstly, it cost hardly any money. We literally went down the back of the, the council's sofa to find, find the money to run this. It, um, I'm extremely pleased with the way that Emma and her colleagues have kind of developed this to be uh, a more efficient, more efficient scheme, which will hopefully deliver you know, better outcomes. So I'm delighted with the way that uh, you know, this has been, uh, it's been further, further developed. Um, but you know, it's not just about planting a few trees in each parish. I know the effect this has had on quite a lot of parishes, that it's raised awareness of the fact that we have fewer trees in South Cambridgeshire than anywhere else in the country, about the importance of planting trees. And I know a lot of parishes, such as my own, have you know, taken their three free trees from last time and then decided to plant a whole load more of their own volition. So this was about awareness raising. 
Um, so, I mean, I'm sure that uh, when the, the publicity stuff goes out, we'll be making a big song and dance about, you know, the, the, the um, paucity of tree cover here and the importance of uh, planting trees, but also pointing out that six isn't enough, you know, start encouraging your landowners, your farmers and so on to be doing, doing a whole load more. And picking up on Councillor Howell's concerns, can we please uh, stipulate that these trees will be provided with biodegradable um, protective collars, please, rather than more plastic? And I have seen the biodegradable ones around, uh, so it's not impossible. Um, good. And could we also, are we, I, and I know we're doing this in a very efficient way, and so therefore it's not costing much money, but are we monitoring in any way the survival of the trees? <laughs> not yet. I mean, it's something that I could go back to the parishes that have already received trees, and we could um, we could actually sort of ask that question. Um, depending on the outcomes, obviously, 54 parishes, we might not get responses from all 54, but um, I can all, by all means contact them again to um, find out how they're doing. I tend to, I think last year in, in the tree um, week, we, we did um, we did a sort of publicity sort of um, promotion sort of then of all the people. And I don't know if you obviously remember that on social media, a lot of people were sharing the trees that they had planted. So um, I'm happy to say that <laughs> there were quite a few that looked like they were doing okay then, but obviously we'd like to see how they're doing now as well. So yes, I can go back to them. Great, good, thank you very much. Councillor Ellington. So it's much easier to put my hand up. <laughs> Could we say that if they, their tree has died from last year, we don't give them another one? <laughs> We're going out for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, what is interesting as, as well on this is, um, just in, in, in my village, a bit like Councillor Smith is, what's happening now is they've done this lovely thing where they've gone out and said, where would you like to see trees? So the first action was around, okay, where does the parish council, I know that a lot of parish council, where can we put it, where can we put it, you know, what do we do? And there was a lot of opportunism, I think was the word that Councillor Khan used. But um, what's interesting, as Councillor Smith is saying, it sort of, you know, started this discussion now of where would you like to see trees? Where should we have trees? Where can we have trees? And that links then to, I think, Councillor Ellington's point about, and so therefore, how are we making sure that these would be managed and maintained you know, on, on land and, and, and so I think those processes are the ones that are being kick-started now, which are really important. Thank you very much. I wouldn't vote for, for punishment just yet, Councillor Ellington, as seen as we're trying to behave it to. But I think um, if we could have some kind of monitoring and understand what's what's happening, that, that would be good, even if it's light touch at the moment. Thank I think, you. I think we will be getting they will be getting support from the um, suppliers, you know, and after sort of um, care sort of service as well. So if they do have any issues, they can actually sort of speak to them. So hopefully that'll help. A comment on the on, on the on the replacement of trees. I think it is a bit care. You have to be a bit careful. I know that studies have been in various places where they've uh, supplied past trees, and this applies to Council Howell, Howell as well. Uh, uh, and it was eventually found that the uh, the problem was not so much in the. Uh, the planting, but, but the fact that the trees by the time they were already dead by the time they arrived, particularly this particular problem with bare root trees, if they're not properly managed and not properly cared for, uh, they can end up being dead and, and not for all the work, it doesn't matter. So I'd be very hesitant about blaming the, uh, the, the parishes, but make sure that we make sure that we uh, properly give them information so that they can handle them properly uh, and take care of them when they arrive. Thank you. And we move to agenda item 11, which is um, very, very important and links back to the two items which we had on our zero carbon action plan and on the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this is the Cambridge and Peterborough Independent Climate Commission recommendations to the combined authority, decisions that have been taken recently by the combined authority board and their implications for South Cams. And I think we have leader, Councillor Bridget Smith, who is going to talk to us. Well, there's not, there's not really very much to say as things stand at the moment. So uh, the combined authority um, voted not unanimously, um, which was a shame, to adopt the Climate Commission's recommendations. Um, the mayor has suggested that I take the lead role for the environment there. It hasn't been ratified by the board yet. Uh, we've just been uh, trying to agree what the, uh, what the sort of job description is. Um, but uh, what I, I amended it to make sure that the combined authority 
has a, sees itself as a role to play with the Oxford-Cambridge arc as well, because obviously we've got some very, very ambitious uh, principles coming through that, but also we've got a spatial framework which is going to, uh, the consultation is going to start, I think, in the next two weeks. And so it's really important that all everybody involved in the arc, and of course the combined authority is a very key player, uh, pushes through spatial planning of green spaces in order to deliver on the on doubling nature. And the ARC Environment Group, which I lead and which Liz Watts chairs, is meeting this week and uh, has had a nice, very nice simple paper about you know, what's actually meant by, by doubling nature. Um, and it's about taking all the, the natural assets as one and doubling, doubling them in total. So not just doubling the amount of blue space and doubling the amount of uh, woodland space. It's about the actual sort of the actual ac acreage and do, doing that. So, you know, there's no point in us acting in isolation, the combined authority acting in isolation. You know, we're part of a much bigger entity which has you know, serious potential for significant investment into, um, the, into the environment, into doubling nature in, in particular. And what I will be talking to the mayor about when uh, I have the opportunity is about establishing some fund that people can bid into for these, these significantly sized, um, uh, yeah, significantly sized projects that, that can really make an impact on the environment. Uh, so, you know, we've seen some fabulous work which the RSPB is leading on and which anyone can go up to Ooze Fen and see where they are doing restoration, well, it's creation actually of wet, wetland, not restoration, creation of wetland focused on particular species. So at Ooze Fen, uh, they were targeting bitterns, marsh harriers, and I think reed warblers. Well, there's 11 bitterns there, and there was a marsh harrier swooping around when I was there. So it's been incredibly successful in that very targeted, um, you know, creating, you know, creating the environment for specific species that are in danger. And, you know, that, that was taking gravel pits. And the exciting thing there is that the extraction is going on as the restoration work is going on, because it's a massive, massive area. Now, that's a model that can be rolled out across the whole of the arc, because there's going to be massive, massive extraction done there, so we can be creating more and more natural, natural wetlands there. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to engage the combined authority very much in that, um, because I think, and, you know, there's every indication that uh, most of the members of the board take this every bit as seriously as this, this council does. And that's very, that's very encouraging. Um, so, you know, we, we are in the very, very early, early stages of you know, what the combined authorities' role is and what their actions are going to be. But, you know, they are the people who have the potential to get money and get serious amounts of money. And when we can then be players in that to make sure that uh, as part of the whole uh, local um, um, nature partnership work that actually South Cambridgeshire, you know, see, sees the benefit of that as well. Excellent. Um, and on the climate recommendations that were adopted, and as you said, not unanimously, but, but in effect were adopted. So one was that the climate cabinet would be created. So I think that's now going to be called, I think there was an issue, people didn't want it to be called a cabinet. So I think it's going to be called a working group. So that was, that was approved. Um, no idea what the membership of that is going to be. It's going to be, you know, the mayor is going to be on it. I'm not aware that any other elected members are going to be on it as yet. You know, that, it was just, it was approved at the last board meeting. But I think that one of the points was the Independent Climate Commission had a whole host of experts on it and local experts yeah. and the farmers, for example, and they did, there were the farmers and the whole farm committee looking at aspects including peat. So uh, is that, we don't know yet if that sort of whole... So, so the, this, uh, this climate um, working group has been approved by the board that it will, it will exist. Uh, there is absolutely no detail as yet about what the membership of that will be. And there was also the proposal about a, a peat, uh, you know, a group to work with, with peat. Uh, there, was, um, there was considerable pushback from the east of Cambridge. Um, I'm not talking about just the councils, but 
there was concern from uh, two, two councils that the, that any work on you know, preserving peat would negatively impact their local economy. Uh, now, you know, I don't believe that's the case, and I know you don't believe that's the case. You know, there, there is much work that can be done, and I believe the £7 million that's been awarded by the lottery uh, to our area for, for peat uh, restitution is, is, is also talking about methods of farming that can be beneficial to the peat rather than destructive to the peat. And I think the problem is that the, the methods of farming we currently have actually damage, damage the peat. Um, but actually, you know, it's, it's perfectly possible for it to be, it all, everything to work, work well together. And I gather there's a great willingness on the part of much of the farming community to do this. I think there's political nervousness in some quarters about this, is that actually going to be taking farmland out of farming? Uh, will that impact on people's jobs? Will it impact on the economy? Will it impact on uh, the growing of food? Now, it, you know, I don't believe that's the case, but this has to be properly, properly evidenced. So I hope the, the National Lottery Award today will provide that evidence base that gives the politicians confidence that this is the right, the right thing to do. Um, you know, my, my argument at the last board meeting was that we can't, we can't dilly-dally around anymore. You know, the clue is in the fact that this is a climate emergency. And if it's an emergency, we have to act now this minute. We can't, we can't wait. And so there was a call for uh, some of these decisions to be, the, the, the decisions to adopt uh, the recommendations of the Independent Climate Commissions were, were delayed until some more work was done. Well, fortunately, uh, the majority of the people on the board didn't, didn't agree with that. But there's quite, you know, we have to take everybody with us. So there's a big challenge there. We can't have division within the combined authority on these really, really critical issues. Um, everybody, we have to, we have to do some work to get everybody into the same positive, positive place. It's not, it's not a good thing to play political back, back and ball games with, really. Mm -hmm. Good, and I think um, in being in one of those meetings, what, what we did seem, it's a bit like linking back to the one of the earlier agenda items, is if we share um, learning between councils. So, for example. Um, Fenland and East Cams were very interested, as were Punts, in the costings that we did about the decarbonisation of the waste fleet. And, and so, you know, why does everyone have to do that again? Let's sort of look at it, share it, and see what we can, and, and have a, you know, a session which is looking at those different elements of what decarbonisation means to each of the, each of the councils. The other thing, um, Councillor Smith, was this idea about carbon costing that I think the county is going to do and the, and the combined authority committed to, to doing. Was there anything more on that? No, that, w that wasn't discussed any further, but uh, as I say, this was, this was a meeting just to kind of kick, kick things off. And, um, you know, I'm, I've got concerns that uh, the combined authority will need to resource up as far as uh, officer support's concerned, because I don't think they've got that in-house at the moment. Mm -hmm. We've got, um, you know, officers who are generalists, but uh, we know from our own council here mm -hmm. that actually we need specialists in the field because this is, very, this is you know, difficult, complex, specialist stuff that we're dealing with. So I, I'm hoping to have conversations from there very soon about making sure that there are the in-house resources, to make sure that there are the financial resources, and to, um, you know, be very nice if, you know, between the councils and the combined authority, we could set up our own sort of climate summit, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly focused on COP, COP26 as well, to start pulling every, everybody together. And that could uh, be a positive to way to together. bring everybody together. I think, I think it would. And I'd, I'd appreciate any advice that this, uh, this committee could give on that. Any comments or questions on that one? No? Good. And as we sort of said in an earlier item, so, you know, what we do know is that in a way with that adoption, we sort of signed up to seeing how we meet our own aspiration then to increase our ambitions. So let's see that. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, Siobhan, in terms of the final agenda item, forward plan and date of the next meeting. So I have four items. One is a presentation from Hannah Phillips, um, who is the RSVB area manager around that piece of land that was um, being discussed earlier around Usped. Um, the second one is an air quality update from um, our air quality officer. 
The third one is the um, delayed, uh, it was, was going to be at this meeting, but um, a report on the local energy advice partnership work that is, um, it, that is being done in the district, which is about um, advice and referrals for low-income households. And the fourth one is an update on the net zero housing project that our housing um, team is, uh, is, is very much involved in. Good, thank you. And we've just added the one about the private rental. That's yes, I did, yeah, I'll, I'll see whether that's possible for that day. It, um, but it, just the it, forward it, plan it's in general. Certainly on the forward yeah. agenda, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, so and there's the, those four specifically for September. Yeah. Good. And for the next day, we have Monday 13th of September at 2 p.m. Okay, to everybody? Good. Lovely. Well, a jam packed yeah, so agenda. Sorry. Go in on. terms of the further agenda, also, I have, uh, I have noted something um, on our options so far as electric vehicle charging. Um, charging points. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks very much, Yvonne, for that um, excellent agenda and all the work in putting that together. Thank you, everybody. We went on a bit further than half an hour than the four o'clock, um, but lovely to have you all here. Thank you.